sir shaligram sir is also there uh, okay. no can you please remove remove yes i will call no bau sir sir namaskar हेलो सर हाँ सर नमस्कार सर जॉइन होता है सर हाँ सर थोड़ा कार्ड बंद करूँ ये तो क्या कलर है सेमिनार है ना थोड़ा हाँ मैं नहीं तो कर दो बुला हो जाएगा तो कर दो वी आर वेटिंग फॉर ओनली वन मिनट्स मोर कल हम सर कौन हो रहे हैं सर म्यूट पटले सर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स म्यूट या ओके वेलकम यू ऑल शुड वी प्रोसीड नाउ यस वी कैन स्टार्ट ओके Uh, very good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, where you all are uh, present. Uh, respected dignitaries, resource persons, uh, dear researchers, my dear colleagues, and dear students, I am your host, Dr. Lalchand Bhavalal Patle. On behalf of Department of Electronics, MGSM's Art, Science, and Commerce College, Chopra, I extend my warm welcome to all the participants and listeners of One Day International. a uh, webinar on futuristic devices from health cares to quantum computing uh, we are delighted to have our inaugurator for this webinar honorable professor bb pawar sir uh, honorable professor ad saligram sir 
uh, I take an opportunity to welcome you all. Honorable Professor B. Power, sir, Office Setting Pro Vice Chancellor Kavyatri Bainabai, North Maharashtra University, Jalgao. Honorable Professor Edi Saligram, sir, Emeritus Professor, Department of Electronic Science, Sabitri Bai, Pune, Pune University, Pune, India, CEO, uh, CEO of uh, SPPU Research Park Foundation, Pune. We also uh, very delighted to have our today's resource person, Dr. Samadhan B. Patil, Lecturer in Medical Engineering, Department of Electronics Engineering, York Biomedical Research Institute, University of York, UK. Uh, we will have the session of Dr. Prashant Saxena, sir, Lecturer, James Watt School of Engineering, University of Glasgow, Glasgow, UK. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, Lecturer, Department of Electronics and Electrical Engineering, University College of London, UK. Uh, our convener of webinar, Professor A.L. Choudhury, sir, Principal MGSM ASC College Chopra, District Jalgao. Our vice principals, Professor B.T. Patil, Mr. N.S. Kole, Dr. K.N. Sunwane, and all my dear teachers, research scholars, participants, supporting staffs, and my dear students. Once again, I extend my warm welcome to you, uh, each one of you present in this webinar. Uh, I humbly request uh, Professor A.T. Saligram, sir, to preside over the inaugural function. Saligram, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for accepting the presidential sweep of this function. Uh, as we all are facing a global pandemic situation due to coronavirus and are being affected by COVID-19 disease directly or indirectly in the entire world, the coronavirus pandemic made a major impact on almost uh, every field like business, research, academic, uh, traveling and visits, hoteling, etc. And also on our physical conferences, hence we are meeting virtually to share our research ideas, thoughts and all. Uh, in such a hazardous situation, everyone trying their best efforts to kill this pandemic uh, along with medical personnel electronic fraternity are also performing a significant role in combating with coronavirus pandemic by providing automated solutions such as disease surveillance integrated sensors system sensor based sanitizer providing system etc uh, we are trying to contribute from our side to overcome this situation among us most of all are engaging in research activities in various areas hence we are gathered here in this webinar on futuristic devices from healthcare to quantum computing. So I hope you all will get precise information from this webinar. Once again, welcome you all. Now I would like to invite uh, Professor A.L. Chaudhary, sir, convener of this webinar and principal of our college to preface the webinar. Uh, Chaudhary, sir, Hello. over to you, sir. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. You're audible. Okay. Honorable Bayasab Advocate Sandeep Suresh Patil, President of Mahatma Gandhi Shikshan Mandal Chopra, Senate Member of KBC NMU Jalgao. Honorable Thai Sahib Dr. Smita Sandeep Patil, uh, Secretary Mahatma Gandhi Shikshan Mandal Chopra. Uh, Honorable Professor P. Power Sir, Pro Vice Chancellor KBC NMU Jalgao. Keynote Speaker, my Guru and the Chairman of this session, Professor Dr. Edi Shaligam, SPPO Pune, invited speaker Dr. Samadhan Patil, York Biomedical Research Institute, University of York, uh, Dr. Prashant Saxena, James Watt School of Engineering, University of Glasgow, uh, Dr. Sanju Kumar, University of uh, School of London, UK, all my vice principal, all my uh, colleagues, and my dear participant. I heartily welcome all of you in this online webinar. I take this opportunity to introduce my college. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi Shikshan Mandal's Art Science and Commerce College Chopra was established in 1969 by Honorable late Dada Sahib Dr. Suresh Ji Patil, ex MLA, and the former Education Minister late Sau Sharat Chandrika Suresh Patil to spread the value based education and uplift the vocational skill of the rural masses for their holistic development. Last year, we have celebrated the Golden Jubilee. 
the college is permanently affiliated to the kavitri bainabai choudhary north maharashtra university jalgaon college is a, a premier academic institute in this uh, region uh, the college is located in 36 area uh, greenery campus so we received the vanashree award from the government of maharashtra in 2011 the college provides the various undergraduate postgraduate uh, courses programs in arts science and commerce college Uh, arts science and commerce uh, as well as we have some professional courses like bba bca college begins with few student today uh, 3000 students register for pg uj and pg courses in the faculty of arts science and commerce the college is recognized as a research center in seven subject by university i am proud to say that uh, 50 research student awarded the phd degree and 35 students are doing the research in this laboratory we are going for the third cycle of nac the college has uh, to do infrastructure and ict facility for the effective curriculum delivery the students has learned and highly qualified staff members at the who are experts in their respective subject discharging their duties with the sense of dedication and devotion kbc nmu jalgaon just declared our college as a best college award uh, for the year 2018 19 in every pandemic uh, in every academic year we are going to organize state university level state level and national level seminars as a continuation of this activity today's the department of Ele uh, electronics organized the international webinar on uh, futuristic devices from healthcare to quantum computing so this is the first uh, department in the college who are organized first time this international webinar here the ongoing covid 19 pandemic has taught us many new things including the work from home as well as teaching from home uh, previously one uh, no one even thought that these things can be done remotely even this international webinar is possible because of the new technology such as zoom is around us it is used to uh, is to be very difficult to get the hold of uh, international speakers but now as a webinar is going to prove it is possible to attend a lecture from any part of the world we are going from the area of 4g to 5g 5g serving the whole ecosystem of the health digital health such a boost will allow for the reliable communication which is most in areas like tele surgery remote consultancy consultation and remote monitoring telemedicine took a great leap forward during the covid 19 pandemic the doctors can now have access to the patient's data information from on the uh, medication remotely the development of the multiple safe and effective covid 19 vaccine is less than a year may be remembered as one of the great scientific accomplishments in the human society human history the last decade uh, we uh, Okay. Uh, due to technical problem, uh, probably uh, Professor Yel Chaudhary sir's network was. Uh, the last decade. Can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Now you are audible, sir. The past decade was about to rise the digital health technology and the patient empowerment. The next decade will be about the artificial intelligence, the use of health sensors, and so called as Internet of Healthy Things. and how it could improve the millions of lives nowadays almost every has a wider digital footprint and demand for the internet bandwidth is very uh, is ever increasing to meet this requirement and to take it to another level in future research and the development in the new devices supporting the infrastructure related to the healthcare and the quantum computing is inevitable and needs of ours Using the quantum computing, doctors can build the virtual simulation and perform the clinical trials with far more efficacy. Efficiency, we can identify the targeted chemotherapy uh, protocol quicker and with a more customization with the quantum enhanced 
data processing ability and at the post treatment and being able to understand where and why a protocol succeeds or failed more accurately and will give the clinicians and researchers valuable insight. With the next to zero latency, 5G connected sensors and medical devices can scan the capture and transmit the data nearly instantaneously. That's, that will improve the patient monitoring, which will be in turn improve the patient's outcomes. Uh, futuristic are all, already considering the benefits of marriage between the 5G, healthcare and robotics. The healthcare industry is adopting the use of quantum computing to support the patient-centric care of healthcare consumers and treat complex medical conditions with a great efficacy. Uh, we are blessed with the experts in the field to, to present in front of us today. I wish you uh, you will enjoy this webinar today. Thank you. Over to Dr. Patli. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, now, without wasting time, uh, I would like to invite Honorable Professor B.V. Pawar, sir, Pro Vice Chancellor, Kavyatri Bhainabhai Chaudhary, North Maharashtra University, Jalga, for his uh, inaugural speech. Uh, B.V. Pawar, sir, it's over to you, sir. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, yes. sir, you are audible. Uh, very good good afternoon to all uh, friends this is the great great pleasure for me to be with you here today through the virtual mode on the occasion of inaugural function of international webinar on futuristic devices from healthcare to compu uh, quantum computing organized by department of electronics uh, mjsm's arts science and commerce college chopra on behalf of Kavaitri Bhainabhai Chaudhary, North Maharashtra University, Jalga, I would like to take this opportunity to warmly welcome all of you. And as an inaugurator of this webinar, I declare that this webinar is inaugurated and open. Thank you, sir. At the outset, I must compliment pre President of this inaugural function. I must compliment President of this society, uh, Sri Bhaya Sahib Sandeep Patil, all the officer, office bearers of the MJM Mandal, Principal Dr. A.L. Saudari and entire organizing team for envisioning a very relevant theme uh, during this COVID pandemic uh, for this webinar. I must also express my deepest appreciation to the keynote speaker, Professor A.D. Shaligram, Emeritus Professor, uh, Pune University, Pune, Resource Person, Samadhan Patil from York Biomedical Research Institute, University of York, Dr. Prashant Saxena from Glasgow, UK, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar from London, UK, uh, students, teachers, and researchers present online here. The workshops such as these bring all of us together, giving an opportunity by providing a platform to share and express our thoughts about the futuristic devices. Uh, friends, uh, we are witnessing that the future of the healthcare is shaping up in front of our eyes with the advances in the digital healthcare technologies, such as artificial intelligence, 3D uh, printing, robotics, and nanotechnology. We have to familiarize with the latest developments in order to be able to control the technology and not the other way around. The future of healthcare lies in working hand in hand with the technology and healthcare workers have to embrace emerging te healthcare technologies in order to stay relevant in the coming years. Friends, we cannot stop this advancement in the technological development, and sooner or later we'll be, find, we'll be finding out that whole area of our lives have been transformed through the various digital technologies. Thus, our task at the moment is to face our fears about the future with courage, to turn to the technologies with an open mind, and to prepare for changing the world with as much knowledge as possible. We all should believe that this is the only way forward. Technology can only aid and improve our lives if we stand on its shoulder and if we are always two steps ahead of it. In medical and healthcare, digital technology could help transform unsustainable, unsustainable healthcare systems into the sustainable ones, equalize the relationship between medical professionals and patients, provides cheaper, faster, and more effective solution for the diseases like uh, cancer, corona, AIDS, or Ebola. 
and this could simply lead to the healthier individual living in the healthier communities communities but as the saying goes one has to be master of his own house so it is worth starting the future with the betterment of our own health through the digital technologies and as far as quantum computing is concerned uh, it is the exploitation of collective properties of quantum states such as superposition and annealment to perform the computation the devices that perform com- quantum computations we we know we know such devices as com- quantum computers quantum computers are believed to be able to quickly solve the certain problems that other classical computers could not solve in any feasible amount of time and this is called as quantum supremacy uh, the the study of computational complexity of the problems with respect to the quantum computers we know it as quantum complexity theory in short we can say that quantum computing can be a game changer in such fields as cryptography and chemistry material science agriculture and pharmaceuticals when the technology becomes more mature Com- quantum computing has a complex nature and this can be used for the solution of complex mathematical models as technology advances the problems encountered are getting more complex the quantum computing offers a solution to the complex problems like pro- protein modeling the latest global crisis caused by the covid-19 shows that scientific scientists need a different tool to model a single protein and deactivate it and another example we can quote as and since there is an exponential exponential rise in the complex problems uh, in case of energy uses as the human population increases the consumption of energy is also increasing exponentially and more complex problem like optimization of the resources are arising in such cases quantum computing can be used useful to encounter the limitations of complex problems by using the physics of quantum mechanics friends i am sure that this by attending this webinar on futuristic futuristic devices from healthcare to quantum computing and listening to the lectures delivered by the expert resource persons in this webinar Uh, all of us will come to know that the futuristic devices will play an important role in our life and hence we have to go hand in hand with the technology in future then only our life will be comfortable in the coming years i once again congratulate the organizers for organizing this webinar and extend my warm wishes to all of the participants who are present online here and i hope that this online technical sessions spread over the entire day will be fruitful for the uh, uh, online uh, pre- uh, online uh, audience uh, i once again thank the organizers and thank you very much thank you sir uh, thank you sir thank you very much uh, dear participants let us move toward the session uh, so we have uh, along with us uh, professor ad saligram sir our keynote speaker so i would like to request dr kunal de gaikwad sir to uh, introduce our keynote speaker uh, for just a brief introduction uh, kunal gaikwad sir over to you sir okay thank you patel sir good afternoon all uh, myself dr kd gaikwad assistant professor in department of electronics welcome you all again in international webinar on futuristic international Uh, futuristic devices from healthcare to quantum computing 2021 it's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speaker today who is going to talk to us about the smart sensors uh, this is a subject in which we should all be deeply interested because from our day starts and on end of the and end on night the sensors like the gadgets we have in our hand like a mobile phone it consists of lot of sensors like pedometer proximeter sensor and light sensor etc so i take this opportunity to introduce our keynote speaker dr ed chaligram sir he is a ceo of spp pune university research park foundation a, a section of eight company owned by savitri bai phule pune university and a coordinator of mhrd funded design innovation center and emirates professor at the electronic science department 
He was a professor and head department of electronic science at Savitri Bai Phule Pune University prior to his superannuation. He also worked as a in charge director and of educational multimedia research center that is EMMRC and director of examination and evaluation Savitri Bai Phule Pune University till recently. He has been dean of science and technology faculty and officiating registrar of the Savitri Bai Phule Pune University. He was a national coordinator for creation of e-content of electronic science subjects under NME ICT program of MHRD. He also supervised e-content creations of MOOCs course developed by MHRD Swain Portal. In his fact, mm -hmm. he guided 41 students for PhD and 20 students for MPhil. His main field of research interests are embedded systems and VLSI design, nanoelectronics, optoelectronic sensors and systems, LED, lighting systems, performance and reliability, and wireless sensor networks. He has completed 26 research projects funded by various government funding agencies, including DOE, UGC, DIT, DAE, CSI, DST, DRDO, and ISRO as a principal co-investigator. He also published more than 31 books. The one of, uh, from this, five international, he also published five, 565 research papers with 881 citations, out of which 193 papers yeah, and, and international journals and 45 invited talks. He works as an industrial consultant to several industries in the field of electronics, embedded systems, instrumentation, automation, optics, and information technology. Supervise RDSO standard testing LED signals for Indian railways. He has worked as a corporate trainer on embedded systems and VLSI design. And it's very prestigious for us. He has been IEEE member for 22 years. But his work not limited to academic, but he also holding the following position as a specific professional assignment, such as he is the chairman of IEEE Electron Devices Society and India Council Chapter 2016 to 2018. He is the vice chairman of IEEE APEDS Bombay chapter. He is also international consultant on digital IC design under Ministry of Science and Technology of Sri Lankan government. He is the founder chairman of Society for Promotion of Excellence Electronic Discipline, that is SPEED. So now I welcome you again, sir. All dear participants, please join me in welcoming Professor A.D. Shaligram, sir. Over to Edi Edi Shaligram, sir. Hmm. Hello, Edi Edi Shaligram, yeah. sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you see the screen? Yes, yeah, sir. sir. Yeah, sir. It is visible. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. It is indeed a pleasure to participate in this international seminar, one-day seminar. Uh, the topic assigned to me is smart sensors and this is a topic which is very close to my heart because I have been working in the field of sensors for last uh, almost 30 years. Smart sensors, when we say, actually the smart is an acronym which defines the smartness in terms of being specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and timely. And when these all characteristics are um, say followed by any system, any device, they are called as the smart. The sensors with intelligence for achieving all these things, they are essentially called as the smart sensors. Transducers and sensors we know to be useful, an electronic system must interact with their environment. To do this, they use sensors and actuators. Any electronic system that we have around us, we find that the electronic system has got some processor on, on, on board and then there are some sensors and actuators which give that system a feel of what is happening around and what changes one wants to make. Sensors and actuators are examples of transducers. A transducer is a device that converts one physical quantity into another. That is uh, generally sensors when we say we say that some uh, properties of the physical world 
the physical properties or chemical properties or biological properties these are converted into electrical form so that they can be understood monitored and manipulated by the electronic systems it's a sensor is therefore a device which measures or detects a physical property and records and indicates or otherwise responds to it by uh, way of uh, say uh, using the actuators we all know that uh, we are all blessed human beings uh, with various sensory systems the sensing of sight sensing of hearing sense of taste sense of touch sense of smell these are the five primary senses which are available with us and we know that uh, the scientists and technocrats around the world they have essentially tried to mimic these uh, human senses into some electronic system say for example seeing is mimicked through the camera hearing is mimicked through microphone testing is uh, mimicked through the e tongue uh, that is electronic tongue touch is either through a thermometer or through a uh, smart screen uh, electronic skin as it is called so through that uh, one uh, mimics the ski, uh, touch then electronic nose is available for mimicking the sense of smell so we have these different uh, devices which are available in the form of touch sensors light sensors sound sensors ultrasonic sensors and so on so these different uh, types of sensors they help in making the systems more intelligent because intelligence cannot come just arbitrarily intelligence has to be supported with some kind of uh, feel of the environment so there are different types of sensors as we know there are inductive proximity sensors uh, we have uh, the visual sensors by way of some camera or uh, linear optical arrays we have ultrasonic sensors which are used for uh, sensing some distant objects we have four sensors in the form of strain gauges or <laughs> auto switches uh, wheel encoders which are implemented with the help of opto opto switches in fact we are quite familiar with such kind of encoders through the mouse that we used to have at one point uh, ball mouse and uh, we have color color detection sensors also like uh, the color of any object is uh, detected and then uh, once uh, we understand the color there is a manipulation there is a kind of control over the objects there is a orientation sensor in the form of compass and in fact many of these sensors they are also included in the uh, mobile phones smartphones like accelerometer sensor gyroscope magnetometer barometer proximity sensor light sensor touch sensor and so on so these different sensors they essentially make uh, this device smart device and we call it as a smartphone uh, the rfids they have essentially a wider application potential and number of rfid based devices they are available we also have uh, the sensor field quite expanding and in fact uh, i I'll, i'll just mention here uh, one such kind of expansion that has been taking place is in the form of nano bio sensors so these nano bio sensors these are essentially made out of special materials like uh, thin films uh, micro cantilever based uh, kind of things like uh, we have uh, uh, devices called the mems uh, magnetic nanoparticles quantum dots nano wires hydrogel bio functionalized nano particles components and total analysis systems so a variety of uh, such kind of uh, sensor developments that are taking place across the world and sensors specific to a particular application they are also developed optimized and they are made available parallelly we have uh, something called as the internet of things that is pervasive omnipresent intelligence now here we have number of parameters from the environment from all different kinds of objects which are around us those number of parameters they are centrally communicated through what is called as the internet of thing concept and the internet of thing concept is primarily based on uh, essentially cloud computing concept so we have the parameters connectable to the clouds and the clouds then they allow those uh, uh, parameters to be distributed 
to the individual say for example uh, there is a telemedicine now point of care for the patient is somewhere else the medical practitioners are present at some other place the laboratories they are again at a third place so these all essentially can be integrated and the data collected on the specimen from the patients analyzed by the uh, laboratories then that is further forwarded to the uh, medical practitioners who essentially uh, create their expert opinions and they advise the patients for further treatment we know that uh, this whole thing is based on essentially what is called as data science uh, today we are essentially having a, a very wide uh, scope in the field of data science and the data is uh, available in huge amounts because we have the sensors spread across the world and these sensors billions trillions of sensors spread across the world they are generating the data now and then and this huge amount of data that is uh, then made available through the uh, internet of things in, in into what is called as the big data now big data doesn't have any significance unless it is properly analyzed and this analysis is done in step by step fashion data is converted into information information is basically identifying certain patterns of the data and then uh, uh, say classifying that data into those patterns but knowledge is something which is above this information is converted to knowledge whereby there are some experiences which are attached and these experiences when they are attached with the information it gets converted into knowledge it is basically some kind of interpretation of the information now this interpretation could be a passive interpretation unless there is some understanding uh, of the experts associated and this understanding of the experts when it is associated the knowledge gets transformed into what is called as the understanding and this understanding ultimately gets turned into wisdom when we have context associated with the knowledge so we have essentially the knowledge as one aspect which is uh, gathered by way of various sensor means sensing means and uh, they are collected by the communication technologies they are analyzed by the computational tools but again this is not wisdom wisdom is based on context in one context something will be useful in this other context it may not be useful so we need to essentially have this kind of classification and that is what is done these days with the help of what we call as the artificial intelligence ai ai ml essentially helps in uh, rising onto this pyramid of uh, data into converting it into wisdom we now talk about smart sensors we know that smart sensors they offer capabilities in terms of enhanced sensing these are not just simple sensors say normally when we say that we have a thermocouple or thermi um, uh, thermistor now these are typically sensors what do they do is they convert the temperature into some electrical parameter like voltage current or resistance now we have electronic instrumentation capabilities which convert this voltage current or um, say resistance value into uh, understandable parameter and then there is a scale factor there is a kind of calibration which helps in converting that into temperature in say degree centigrade or degrees fahrenheit or degrees kelvin or whatever but enhanced sensing is essentially there is intelligence so there is a customization of intelligence and this customization of intelligence is provided by way of various kinds of experiences being encoded and stored utilized appropriately for purpose of interpretation now for this purpose there are things like communication which is required because the sensor is just one sensor but we may have multiple sensors and they are looking at the same phenomena so in fact when all these different phenomena they are put together all the data from the different sensors is collated together uh, essentially we will derive a context related information and therefore the efficient communication is very important there is a diagnostics uh, that is run the diagnostics is not just run 
by way of looking at the reports uh, what we get in the form of the data or in the form of information but it is run with the help of experience that one has and with this experience in fact we learn we 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 talk about today machine learning but we know that for years together we are learning and we are learning ourselves evolving every now and then through different experiences so diagnostics is based on that particular experience and there are smart ways of handling the systems so there are tasks which are different things and these all things when they are integrated together uh, when when we when multiple facets of this kind they are included then we call it as a smart sensor so sensors record measured variables such as temperature pressure volume in addition they combine signal conditioning and signal processing these are the conventional electronic gadgets electronic uh, circuits uh, then we have the small all rounders usually are equipped with microprocessors or microcontrollers partly also with dsp functionality smart sensors communicate digitally from signal processing onwards so that they are uh, no unnecessarily addda conversion processes such complex sensors which are able to communicate with other devices are quite intelligent and are therefore called as smart the devices are not only digital but also interconnected and able to communicate with each other form a network the mini sensors are based on micro technology nano technology and micro systems technology they can have following interfaces like send linbus ethernet profibus usb firewire lora wan in future we can also integrate 5g so what all this means is that the sensors which are there which basically used to be just some sensing elements now this these sensing elements they are uh, encapsulated with lot of other features which is available through different developments which have taken place over the years so we we see that the electronics which essentially just about uh, 100 years 100 120 years uh, kind of history for electronics but that electronics has uh, provided such kind of impetus to the entire world that we have lots of things which are happening around us now which are governed more than say 40 40 45 45, 45% of uh, the gadgets around us they are governed by electronics we know that uh, there are number of uh, different sensors number of different sensors these uh, different sensors they are providing the data to the cloud so we have uh, sensors like say a gas flow sensor or humidity sensor or temperature sensor so all this data collected at one point by a particular sensor is uh useful only for that particular point but we today find that in our smartphones we keep on getting the weather information and the weather is localized it is not um, uh, the weather condition as forecasted by some central agency in, across the country but it is actually a localized information that is made available to us what is happening at your location what are the different conditions which are there around so these are all provided to you and how these are provided these are provided through the clouds so the information is transferred to the cloud the cloud then transfers the information to appropriate processing terminals the data is processed and then the results are distributed by the cloud to the end users so we have this kind of connected sensors and these connected sensors they are essentially very useful Uh, they are providing information related to the context we know that the electronics technology has essentially uh, been making the devices smaller denser cheaper uh, number of transistors per chip they are increasing at an exponential rate the processors with high computing capability they are there processors with smaller and smaller sizes they are uh, being made available and such kind of development essentially is um, leading to a stage at present that the transistor is reaching a single atom size so at this size a transistor is working and then we have so many different transistors working together as a part of system as part of processor and 
there are various communication interfaces encoding interfaces so these are all integrated into one single chip and we are having such kind of very nicely packaged smaller denser device and this is becoming cheaper in fact people have a concept uh, what is called as smart dust now the smart dust is something like normally we say that we have a dust and we don't bother about the dust in fact we just uh, try to sweep uh, sweep away the dust uh, and uh, we, we we are not uh, worried about we just put it into the dust bins but when smart dust is there that essentially is having intelligence onto it so there are such kind of intelligent chips which are integrated sensors integrated and such kind of a small thing tiny thing which is having such high capacities capabilities that is distributed at a um, location without worrying about recovering it because it is basically distributed and thrown but it keeps on giving you useful information all through this these are essentially some ideas like we have so many mil billions million transistors within 1 cm by 1 cm for cmos ics and there are uh, see number of transistors which are seen like uh, within a human ear cross section if you take then we have these uh, large number of transistors even within that particular area uh, we have technologies like we have technologies like uh, the mems technology micro electromechanical systems which are uh, fabricated using the conventional cmos processes of lithography cmos process of leaching and various other uh, tools and techniques they are used and in fact uh, you can see here there is a motor which is uh, being fabricated and this motor is essentially uh, is uh, having dimension which is smaller than the human ear and such kind of motors they are very much used in the treatments today say mems are uh, kind of devices which are uh, used in the uh, human treatment where the things are injected the devices are injected in the blood flow and when they go into the blood flow at appropriate location there is a delivery of the drugs normally otherwise what happens is we deliver the drugs through the injections or uh, through the um, oral intake and then where actually the ailment is where the treatment is required to reach there there are a lot of other things which are happening lot of other places which are getting affected by that particular drug whereas here the drug delivery is exactly to the pin point where it is required it is delivered and there is there is lot of um, uh, advantage of such kind of technique this basically is called as a nano uh, robotic kind of treatment for various kinds of elements uh, we have uh, basically uh, a block diagram of the system what we call as smart system we have the sensors on one side and we have the adc which essentially converts the data into digital form then we have uh, things like uh, uh, say fourier transforms or frequency estimation some evaluation some ann artificial neural network so these are all essentially put together by something called as a pga based smart processor one one has lots of such options uh, and these different options in fact uh, they allow us to think of uh, newer and newer systems and newer, newer applications the applications of uh, our uh, internet of things best uh, smart sensor network is uh, ra ra rather unlimited but here i have uh, tried to put together some four five areas like home for the consumer transport mobility uh, health for the body care or health care industries in the manufacturing smart cities we talk about where cities are uh, being under surveillance And then farming is another area where there are a lot of things which are uh, say the applications based on the smart sensors so when we talk about smart home we have lot of uh, things around the smart home various facilities various equipment they are essentially controlled by the uh, smart sensors uh, say for example there is somebody who walking through and you can see that this is a place where the person is not seen 
so here the lights are turned off so that there is saving of electricity and when somebody walks in then the lights are seen to be turned on so the intensity is properly available and this person feels at comfortable level so we have such kind of uh, smartnesses this is a very simple example but uh, number of different levels of smartnesses they can be brought in say for example there is a robotic um, uh, arm here rather the uh, jaw and we see that he is uh, this robotic uh, grip is uh, holding an egg now when the egg is held there there is a very interesting uh, optimization that is required if you hold that particular egg little tightly then it will break and if you hold it uh, slightly loose because it is uh, very smooth and it is essentially it can slip off very easily so you have to have optimum pressure applied so that it doesn't slip and it doesn't break so this kind of intelligence that is provided by the robotic grippers these days we have the, the augmented reality kitchens where variety of kitchen uh, operations they are say performed with the help of the augmented reality uh, facilities say a very simple thing like a spatula the thing which is used for stirring or serving uh, the cooked food items or cooking the food while, while cooking food uh, food so here this spatula is essentially uh, specially designed which has got uh, different sensors like there is a ph sensor there is a temperature sensor there are salinity sensors there is a viscosity sensor so these different sensors they are incorporated within the spatula and as a result what happens is normally otherwise the cook is supposed to essentially keep watch on what happens uh, to the food say any food preparations so the cook is supposed to add some salt or add some sugar or add some uh, other things maybe check whether it is appropriately uh, sour or appropriately sweet or whatever so these are all different things they are essentially sensed by the sensors and therefore the spatula itself serves the purpose of uh, say uh, helping the cook without getting into the contamination of the food so you can see that when the cooking is done the spat this spatula can be used and many such appliances they are essentially being developed and they are used uh, we have the security systems wherein number of sensors distributed at different locations and at one place say maybe your mobile phone also you can have that kind of app and here essentially you can have uh, the entire information about what is happening inside the house say if some intruder is entering in or if some switch is uh, on or if something uh, is uh, say some gas is leaking and there is a likelihood of fire all such kinds of details they are essentially made available onto your mobile phone and then uh, wherever you are you can get alerts wherever you are you can decide how to uh, tackle with the situation and the situation gets activated appropriately and it is uh, orca uh, you have the sensors smart sensors in the transportation system as well number of transportation related things like say for example these days we we are facing uh, across the country the problem of very bad roads and uh, the bad roads are because there are potholes created because of the monsoon and uh, various heavy traffics now here the sensors are embedded within the road when the road is constructed so when the road is constructed exact location of any damage to the road or any kind of likely damage to the road that would be alerted and that information can be made available to the people responsible for uh, naturally the maintenance of the road and the road conditions could be appropriately maintained we have the vehicles these days carrying lot of electronics onto them and these vehicles they essentially provide assistance to the driver not only that but they also deal with the external things uh, in much more improved fashion there are number of smart sensors used with the vehicles say for example cameras are there radars are there 
uh, there are different kinds of senses for different uh, motions, different uh, combustion related issues, emission control and so on. Say for example, when on the roads, there is a lot of traffic. So this traffic, you can see multiple lanes of uh, traffic are there and there are cars which are moving. But these have uh, radar sensors on them. And these radar sensors, they definitely would uh, advise the car drivers. And uh, even at times, if the car driver doesn't listen to the advice, they would force that uh, you should not do this. So essentially, therefore, collision can be avoided. Any lane cutting can be uh, avoided. Any, any, anywhere the driver is dizzy, uh, maybe going off the road, so he can be alerted. And maybe there can be even uh, with, with the modern cars, there is a possibility that uh, a driver is uh, completely bypassed and the car is driven by self driving mode. We have the facilities in the cities which are essentially provided with lots of sensors and a lot of radars. So these essentially would live monitor the traffic and any, any kind of unpleasant uh, incidents, they can be completely avoided by this. Then we, we, we come to the uh, wearable internet. We know that uh, we have a variety of things on our body. In fact, uh, there are a number of gadgets which are now available. So for example, Apple Watch was developed in 2015. And this Apple Watch contained almost everything as a smartphone. So it, it essentially has everything, all the sensors, all the processing capabilities, all the communication capabilities that it had. So that was released. Now this, this is something which is uh, basically you can wear on your wrist, but you have lots of other implements and these implements, they can be at different places on your body. Even your clothing can include many of such devices. And these all devices, they integrate together, they work together, and they give status related to uh, your health condition, or even if you're healthy and you're, uh, say, going for an exercise. So what is the amount of exercise? What kind of uh, things which are happening within your body? So all these things, they can be essentially completely monitored, and there is a complete uh, knowledge about what happens. Say, for example, these days we are aware of how many steps we have taken or we have walked through a pedometer kind of app on the mobile phone. And there are a number of pedometers which are available, not just included in the mobile phone, but even standalone pedometers with very low cost, maybe 100 rupees, 200 rupees. You can get a good pedometer and you can essentially check the kind of exercise pattern that you are following. In fact, it is not just for the purpose of monitoring the exercise, but it is also useful for monitoring patients or monitoring the elderly persons. Because if the elderly persons say they have certain issues with their health, then uh, they may not be in a position to communicate. So these uh, devices, they observe that there is a uh, change in the pattern of this person's walking or he is uh, not behaving the normal way. So they, they essentially generate alerts themselves. So we have body sensors, which are uh, say, pasted like a tattoo on your body, or there are uh, different kinds of patches which are there, or some uh, variable appliances like a ring or some wristband. So these are all different things, or even such kind of uh, say bracelet like thing. So you have these devices and uh, even say to some extent, like there is a dental implant. So in, in your uh, say, uh, jaw, you can fit such kind of dental implant with uh, some sensors on it and there is a communication capability provided. And then you can have the health status, uh, various parameters monitored on either the wristwatch or on mobile phone. And it is not just on your mobile phone, but it can be linked to several uh, other mobile phones like uh, your say close relatives or friends or maybe your uh, family doctors or even the nearby expert hospitals and so on. So these, these all things, these interlinkages, they essentially uh, uh, protect you wherever you are.
say as as an interest you may have a interest about like uh, how well do i sleep because uh, sleep is a very important uh, phenomena in human's life and if you sleep well if your sleep pattern is very appropriate and healthy then you will feel fresh the next day and for days together but if you have disturbed sleep the sleep essentially uh, is not very tight or it is uh, disturbed at times so essentially you would have a trouble and there will be a warning there will be a warning uh, issued to you that your sleep pattern is not very good so there there are researches which are being done along with this sir you are muted yourself i didn't mute but fine so we we can have number of such uh, gadgets mounted on your body and you can have say things like glucometer sensor body temperature sensor pulse and pulse oximeter sensor uh, blood pressure sensor uh, position sensor air flow sensor for the breathing measurement electrocardiogram ecg sensors and so on number of sensors mounted on the human body and then the entire thing is uh, connected to a processor and the processor then communicates it to the rest of the world so you have such kind of health monitoring very easily possible and uh, this uh, kind of with this kind of smart health monitoring with the smart sensors it is possible that we can consider ourselves to be very privileged and uh, we, we we essentially can see that things are becoming better and better for the human life there is another area where the smart sensors are very widely used and that area is in the manufacturing industry smart it's sensors are visible sorry smart sensors are used in uh, manufacturing industries uh, for monitoring the status of the manufacturing items various machines which are being processing and uh, there is a uh, say quality inspection that is being done so all these essentially they are integrated through systems and we get uh, the manufacturing completely monitored we also talked about smart city the smart city as we know has a lot of things which are there the smart city has got some water body it has got some industries it has got gardens it has got various appliances it has got public utility areas it has got residential areas it has got uh, roads and transportation and all such kinds of things they are, they require smart monitoring and smart control so maybe we we say that water quality and quantity control or energy gas and water leakage or uh, say health intelligent shopping uh, education traffic management uh, environment management buildings various kinds of building automations so all these different things they are possible 
with the help of smart sensors so for example city surveillance is done with the help of number of cameras cctv is we are quite aware but not just cctv for the sake of uh, watching the recording in networks but while the things are happening a bit of things to intervene and to get the things going smoothly say for example the traffic management is being done smoothly with the help of cctv is and uh, there is a close uh, control over the uh, things which are happening similarly the waste management and the waste collection as well as disposing how it is done it is done through a uh, cloud support cloud platform support and there there are lots of things which are lots of sensors which are there sensors which are in the garbage cans or the uh, uh, collect collection things sensors on the vehicles sensors in the buildings and uh, various kinds of alerts they are generated for uh, purposes like the governance or for purposes of recycling or manufacturing health and safety authorities and so on we also have a data center for each city in a smart city there is a data center that is required and the data center is a huge computing facility as well as networking facility this networking and computing facility has to be reliably operated and therefore for uh, monitoring the health of such facility like the vibration or temperature and humidity or uh, air flow through this for the thermal management or any flooding or water leakages which are happening so for all this there is a very uh, large number of sensors smart sensors which are required we also come to a field called smart farming and agricultural related uh, sensors are used for this we have uh, different kinds of uh, systems in the agriculture field which are getting automated and they are connected to the cloud connectivity and data analytics we are essentially having uh, age advantage say for example for monitoring the climate condition uh, for greenhouse automation crop management cattle monitoring and management you have number of sensors put on them you have the precision farming knowing exactly what is the health status of the uh, particular plants their ph the moisture light level etc uh, also the irrigation uh, in fact there are things like hello plant smart sensors these are the sensors which are uh, put into the vicinity of the plants and then this uh, information is available on a remote device or on your smartphone so you can essentially interact and you can identify what is happening there are things uh, available to the uh, farmers for the planting for seeding for uh, weeding purposes pest control purposes so different kinds of systems are available drones are there for the purpose of uh, say spraying various things or even surveying so we come to the conclusion that sensor is a device which detects or measures physical property and records indicates or otherwise responds to it with advancement in technology sensors with different sizes and specifications are becoming available at affordable cost a smart sensor is a device that takes into inputs from the physical environment and uses built in compute resources to perform predefined functions upon detection of specific input and then process data and is capable of communication with other devices and clouds easily and flexibly now this is most important part because easily otherwise such kind of systems were built in past but today it is becoming so easy that you can just plug in and this thing start working some smart sensors are capable of multi sensing and can measure pressure temperature humidity gas flow and more in one sensor means one package single package module so naturally that becomes very handy and easy to use the smart sensors can perform assessments and self calibration also they in fact have the capabilities included for the repair self repair so such kind of things they definitely would help us uh, in building the systems for the uh, smart sensors use 
in variety of applications including iot for fields like smart homes smart transport smart health smart industries smart cities and smart farming so all these things we are essentially experiencing partly today and in future definitely the is माय व्यूज हियर थैंक यू thank you sir thank you very much for your uh, nice session uh, now moving for uh, further sessions so let me take a opportunity to introduce our next speaker dr samadhan patil sir dr samadhan patil sir is a lecturer in medical engineering at the department of electronics engineering and york biomedical research institute university of york uh, he leads the group working on biosensors and lab on a chip devices before moving to york he worked at james watt school of engineering university of glasgow university college london imperial college london institute of micro and nano system lisbon and iit bombay he is also a co-founder of two startup companies uh, that are multicolor dx and 3p sense he has published more than 50 research articles in various reputed journals we are very fortunate to hear you sir i request dr samadhan patel kindly start the session samadhan patel sir it's over to you sir thank you thank you lalchan ji uh good afternoon for me this is morning yet actually and uh, first thing i would like to do is i would like to thank organizers for this opportunity to present in front of you uh it's actually immense pleasure to to present my result or my work in front of the audience from my home country uh let me take this opportunity for something which is very serious actually i would like to devote this particular lecture to those who lost their lives during the pandemic uh and their families uh there are two people who were really close to me and i would attribute those devotions to them one is professor rinty banerji from iit bombay uh school of biomedical research she lost her lives actually a couple of weeks before that was really serious shock to the entire scientific community in iit bombay or actually across india and to one of my friend who who was my school friend actually sham kant so without further ado let me crack on uh so as it was introduced uh, i'm currently working at York Biomedical Research Institute in York uh the results which we i am going to present today they are actually part of my work or you can say those, those are snapshot of my work at University of Glasgow University College London uh, the particular department was London Center for Nanotechnology which is visible over here let me start with a point uh, thank you for that and some of the work was done in imperial college london and other one some of the latest results are from institute of microsystems and nanotechnology which is located in lisbon so these are different pictures from the work which has resulted so far 
Uh, my job has been done quite easy by Professor Shaligram. He introduced the subject to the depth, actually, and I need not have to repeat the same things. So normally, uh, sensors are these devices which help us to recognize or measure parameters around us, which are within the capacity of our sensory system for human or beyond the sensory system. And those can qualitatively or quantitatively, selectively measure these physical, chemical, or biological entities. So it was already mentioned that right now, most of you are using at least four to five sensors. So one sensor is a photodiode, which is CMOS camera of your phone or your laptop. Another sensor which most of you are I am using right now is a microphone on my mobile phone. So it is very classic example of memphis device. So it is the diaphragm and the diaphragm is actually going to and fro. There are other sensors like electrochemical sensors and these are very widely used all around the world. So if you, you might have seen most of the elderly, they use these sensors to look at their glucose level in their blood. So for blood sugar monitoring, most of the people, they use electrochemical sensor. And as the name suggests, these are electrochemical sensors. So change in chemical reaction is reflected as electronic signal. Other very important category of sensor is magnetic sensor. Maybe most of you are un might be unaware that our hard drive has very interesting sensor and it is called spin wall or tunnel junction. And there was a discovery which got a Nobel Prize in 2007. Uh, and this Nobel Prize was attributed for giant magneto resistance. So it, you might have seen back in late 90s or in 2000, our hard drive used to be around 500 MB or at the max 1 GB. And suddenly the capacity of our hard drives, they increased from 500 MB -ish to 60 gig gigabytes. So that was the sudden jump and it was a result of giant magneto resistive sensor. So this was the preamble, but uh, this, this particular subject was widely introduced by Professor Shadram. I would like to thank to him actually for doing this job. So the sensors which I'm going to present in this particular lecture is uh, in the category of biosensors actually, and those which are mostly going to be used for early diagnosis. So most of you know, as I already mentioned, that electrochemical sensors, they are used for looking at blood sugar monitoring or for looking at cholesterol. But can we really use sensors for more complicated things like early detection of heart attack? You can see the mortality which is associated with heart attack or stroke is quite high. Uh, can we really look at HIV infection much before the patient becomes very seriously ill. And now the current pandemic, can we really look at COVID infection in a very, very early phase? So many research groups are actually currently working in this direction. I'm not alone. And then there will be also work on prostate cancer, which is done in my group and in class. Then these sensors, one of the application which I'm going to mention is drug screening. Imagine many kids or children, they face multiple types of infections and those could be bacterial infections or viral infections. And in case of bacterial infection, if you go to a medic, medic will actually prescribe broad spectrum antibiotic. So what does it mean by broad spectrum antibiotic? It's like combination or cocktail of multiple antibiotics at the same time. But if that antibiotic is not designed for particular bacterium, then that particular antibiotic will not work at all. So there are multiple groups. They are looking at 
screening of these drugs, which are specific to particular applications. There are some sensors which can be used in remote setting by the patient bedside or in ambulance or in pharmacy. So as a part of this lecture, first I will take you through a hybrid device. And this particular device, which I developed in uh, Institute of Microsystems and Nanotechnology in Lisbon. So this was marriage between two devices. One is MEMS and other is Spintronic sensor. Very interesting story, actually. Second one is completely MEMS-based device for biosensing. So I have used this particular device for looking at HIV infection monitoring. And then there is one royal disease called hemophilia. So hemophilia is sort of a disease where once there is a wound to your body, then blood doesn't want to stop. So you go through profuse bleeding. And then third application is drug efficacy. Third case study, which I'm going to present you is looking at microchip-based, CMOS-based sensors, which are photodiodes or ion-sensitive field effect transistors. So this is actually on-chip metabolome device. So a device which is literally on a small microchip, 3 mm by 3 mm, and it can look at different metabolites in your body in real time. So these are three cases we'll look one after other. So before I proceed, sorry, I don't know why there is this interruption, but let us deal with it. So most of you might be knowing that if we have to go through a very uh, high resolution imaging, then one has to go through a tunnel of MRI machine, or uh, we have to sit around micro, <clears throat> so magneto encephalography machine, which is actually a giant magnet or a giant superconducting coil. And it produces magnetic field around two to three Tesla. And then you can measure a minutest magnetic field sensing or magnetic field signal, which is coming out of your brain or heart. And it is of the order of 10 to the power minus 12, which is Pico Tesla or Femto Tesla. So for this application, imagine you have to use a device called as SQUID, so which is acronym for superconducting quantum interference device. So could we possibly replace this big giant device uh, by using simple handheld device? And that was the motivation behind this particular work actually. Could we develop handheld device which can be worn by like a hat or in a hand, or it can be a rod to, for the magnetic imaging of your head or from your heart or sentinel lymph nodes which are related to multiple diseases such as breast cancer. So study started with the development of very fundamental device, which is called microelectromechanical systems, which is simply called as MEMS. So MEMS, those are normally fabricated on silicon substrate, imagine. So those are normally fabricated on silicon substrate. So deposition temperature or fabrication temperature is usually around 1000 degrees Celsius. And it is quite challenging if we, are, we have to bring down this temperature from 1000 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius to deposit it on glass or on plastic. So this was the technology which we developed in uh, Institute of Microsystems and our technologies, we, you can see the logo. So we take a glass, on top of the glass, you can pattern rate this photoresist. And this was very intelligent use of photoresist actually, because in many MEMS devices, the layer which is used to free up the MEMS. So normally, let me introduce you what is MEMS. So MEMS, stands for micro because of the size is in microns. Electro means it has electronic functionality. It, you can control the function of this device. Mechanical means it has mechanical movement. So it can either vibrate or deflect. And system, so it has peripheral ability to control it. 
So imagine since it can move, it has free components. So it is exactly like a microchip, which is in your mobile phone or in a computer, but it has the component which can move. So as I mentioned, in your smartphone, there are three MEMS based sensors. One is microphone. Second is accelerometer. So if you go in one of the widgets, you can access accelerometer. And then third one is gyroscope. So when you rotate your microphone, the picture actually automatically tilts and that is because of gyroscope. And all, all these things are possible because there are movable components or free components in your system. So this is traditionally done by using silicon dioxide as a sacrificial layer or silicon itself as a sacrificial layer. And the gap is normally of the order of 500 micron. So in this particular category, the gap will be just one micron. So imagine reducing gap from half a millimeter to just one micron. That was interesting aspect of this particular technology. So that's why photoresist was used. Then you deposit another material called silicon, thin film silicon, and aluminum as a counter electrode. And in final step, you selectively remove these photoresist to make or create suspended structure, or it can also be called as microbridge. So this is scanning electron micrograph of the microbridge, which is 40 micron long. So how 40 micron, imagine this is the width of human hair and 10 micron wide. And this particular microchip was also deposited on glass and also on plastic substrate. So once this particular technology was developed, we went to another level of complexity. So we thought of complicating the things. So this is MEMS device. And my laboratory uh, also had another expertise of fabrication of spin wall devices. And we thought of, can we marry MEMS with spintronic devices? And the intention was, can we actually make this device function at higher frequency to reduce one over F noise. So imagine this is the MEMS device. This is the spin ball, which is at the bottom and the magnetic field lines, which are coming out of this permanent magnet, which is integrated on top. It, because of the vibration of the MEMS device, these magnetic lines of force, they change and you see the signal and it reduces one over F noise. So, <laughs> It was quite difficult actually. So in the beginning, if you treat one device as a bride and other device as a bridegroom, so sometimes it used to happen that there was no bride at all. So one device used to disappear. So I really respect the fabrication community. It is really, really difficult to fabricate the devices which work, one thing. And then after they start working, then to drive these devices to the absolute refinement, to perform their tasks to the minutest level to increase the sensitivity. So until you drive this device to its absolute limit, you are not going to get a paper published in journal. So you have to show the novelty. So you have to go one step beyond what is existing. And sometimes you should have complete novelty. So it's quite difficult to make devices work and then on another level to make devices sense the biomolecules or biomolecular entities actually. So it is quite challenging because sometimes your biomolecular signatures, they don't survive on physical surfaces. So uh, in multiple efforts, so this work went on for three years and in through multiple fabrication runs. So it was sort of seven mask lithography procedure. So there used to be seven mask uh, fabrication procedure actually. And at the end of fabrication run, either we used to see MEMS device and entire spin wall or tunnel junction used to be washed off. Otherwise we used to see the tunnel junction surviving but the MEMS will just fly off. And even if in some attempts we were able to see both, they won't talk to each other. So those were the difficulties which we had. 
But finally, we managed to uh, make it working and we increased the sensitivity of these devices from micro Tesla to several hundred nano Tesla. So that was the first generation of that device. And in later part, you can see I moved from micro cantilevers. So micro cantilevers are small diving boards. So those who are related to mechanical engineering or those who have seen Olympic, they might have seen the diving board. So diving boards are cantilever. And this is the absolute mimic of this one on micron level. So if I move from micro cantilevers to the paddle, so imagine a paddle of bicycle, then the level of amplitude I was getting was quite high actually. And then we went through the modification of magnetic flux guide, which acts as a scavenger of the magnetic field, just like a plastic scavenger or rubble scavenger. So with this device, we went further down to 40 nano Tesla. And in third generation of devices, we again modified magnetic flux guide on both sides. You can see this magnetic flux guide was kept as it is, but we increased another magnetic flux guide on this side and increased the detection level to 700 pico Tesla. So this is exactly the kind of magnetic field which comes out of our heart. And imagine just a small microchip of the dimension of three millimeter by six millimeter can perform the task of the giant squid or giant MRI device. So this is the sort of, uh, you can say level of details or level of precision or level of sensitivity you can get actually. And all this is possible because of the one over F noise reduction. So imagine most of the devices around us, they suffer from one over F noise at zero frequency. And if you modulate or if you increase the frequency of operation of these devices, the noise goes down and signal stands out. So imagine actually this is the signal graph and you can see that the signal went down to 55 pico Tesla, which is very close to the signal which we get it from uh, heart actually. So this was one application. And now this particular work is being taken, taken forward in the direction of for which it was initiated. Now, as I mentioned to you, similar to the current pandemic in COVID, most of us, our families, we launch for the early monitoring of infection. Imagine this plot has become so relevant. So if on the left, it is concentration of biomarkers. And this is the deterioration of the patient along X axis. So even before developing the disease, when the patient is in hospital, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, perfect. So aim is to aim is to monitor the symptoms or detect the infection in early phase, actually. Hi, Prashant. Uh, and we wanted to detect HIV infection in its early phase, actually when the person is up and running. So there was freedom to choose uh, from many markers. So these are called biomarkers. So biomarkers are sort of biomolecules which are present in our blood. And we try to monitor these biomarkers after taking a human sample from the subject. So from the kind of biomarkers which we had, one was GP140 is a protein which is very similar to the protein which is shared by coronavirus. Other biomarkers are immunological biomarkers which is anti-P24. And aim was to pass the liquid or a liquid sample from a chip inlet pass it over to the 
Could you bring the number to everyone? I would really appreciate it. Hello. Yeah, thank you. That's really good. Uh, so the aim was to pass to pass these biomarkers over the micro cantilever sensors. And these micro cantilever sensors will be functionalized with biomolecules, which are called receptors. And those biomarkers will be captured on these receptors. And you will see the deflection. So these are the first set of micro cantilevers which I've fabricated at London Center for Nanotechnology. The typical length of these sensors is around 5 mic 500 micrometer, width around 100 micron, and thickness around 1 micron. And this is the entire wafer, which is 5 inch wafer. And on one chip, you can see ap approximately 250 devices. So one microchip is visible over here. And what happens actually, this is the first stage. You achieve the device, but after you fabricate the device, your device should be capable of recognizing the biomolecule of your interest because otherwise it can respond to each and everything and it will be complete messy signal. And to do this, you have to put specific biomolecules on top and this is really complicated process. As complicated as fabrication of the biosensor itself. And imagine I did put in almost five years to perfect this process. So once you fabricate the processor or a microchip, you have to deposit gold layer on top. And on top of that, you put self-assembled monolayer. And on top of self-assembled monolayer, you create a capture nanobody or antibody. So this is actually a monoclonal, monoclonal antibody. So we didn't use monoclonal antibodies. We use the nanobodies from the LAMA as the captures or the receptors. So this is how this particular, this particular micro cantilever sensors, they work. So you deposit gold. And after deposition of the gold, you put self-assembled monolayers and the capture nanobody. And once you pass the analyte of your interest, like blur sample or antibiotic sample, sensor goes through this bending. So this was measuring cantilever, this was a reference cantilever, and you can look at the differential signal. So this was extremely good piece of work, which resulted in a very good publication actually. This was published in Nature Nanotechnology in 2015, where we were able to look at the signature of HIV infection down to 500 femtomolar capacity. Imagine this signal corresponds to 500 femtomolar. And when we replicated exactly same chemistry on top of surface plasmon resonance, which is sort of a gold standard technique for surface assay, we could measure only up to 50 nanomolar. So there was this difference of almost nine orders of magnitude. And this difference accounted to the sensitivity of the sensor. So apart from HIV infection monitoring, we also used it for hemophilia. So as I already mentioned, hemophilia is the disease where the person goes through profuse bleeding actually, and you have to provide one person, one dose of factor eight protein to stop the bleeding. Each dose of factor eight costs around two lakh rupees, so which is equivalent to 2,000 pounds or 2,000 euros. Now, it happens that many patients, they take this dose unnecessarily without monitoring because of the lag of, lag of getting results and the time they want to take this dose. Because many times what happens if you hand over your sample for blood testing, you normally get report after two to three days. In, in many cases, it can go to up to five days. But in this case, if you have a luxury of looking at factor eight concentration instantaneously like blood sugar, then you can save literally two lakh rupees 
per week. So that goes down to 10 lakh rupees per month. And 10 lakh rupees per month, uh, if you look at the saving of the cost per year, then it will go almost to one crore. So for one patient, mistosing can save almost one crore per year. And imagine there are thousands of patients of hemophilia around. So you can see this burden on healthcare system or uh, in, in a countries where there is no government's healthcare system, then it is a burden on himself. So the device which can look at bleeding disorder can save almost two lakh per week to the patient. And this was again, this, these results, they again went into the nature of technology actually. And it was very good quality work which came out. Now I will take you to another one where actually most of us or most of the clinicians, they use uh, vancomycin as a last line of defense antibiotic when you go through a surgery or when you go through certain number of infection, which is similar to MRSA. And there was a company in US, they developed one antibiotic which was much better than vancomycin. So you can see this is the effect of vancomycin on calibrated on microcantilever sensor. And this is another new antibiotic which was developed by US based company. You can see that vancomycin doesn't produce any signal on vancomycin resistant bacteria. You can see the flat line over here. Whereas uritavancin immediately produces the signal on the same bacterium within few seconds, imagine, with much lesser dose. So imagine vancomycin concentration is around 300 micromolar here, whereas oritavancin concentration was around 0.5 micromolar. So this was the company which approached us in University College London to decipher the mechanism of action of the antibiotic because they couldn't resolve this and they were de deprived or denied FDA approval. And actually this resulted in multiple patents and one very good quality publication again in Nature's scientific reports. And this became sort of a benchmark for standardizing multiple antibiotics actually. And that, that resulted in quite good quality work. So after that, I will take you through another type of device which doesn't use microelectromechanical systems, but it uses the planar chip, which is CMOS chip, very similar to the one which is in mobile phone or in our computers. And I use this particular chip to look at the metabolites. So metabolites are actually very small molecules in our blood and their size is around 10 kilodalton. So most of the biomolecules, they are measured in terms of daltons. So the size is around 10 kilodalton. Protein size is around 100 or 150 kilodalton. So these are very small molecules. And it is said that we are what we eat actually. So our blood or our body sample contains, or our body is actually the result of how we live and what we eat. So the relative fingerprint of these molecules in our body, they vary according to our age, the way we live, the way we exercise. And this relative abundance is actually an indicator of a healthy state or a disease state. So we use these biomolecules, which, which are called as choline, sarcosine, glutamate and L-amino acid for the prostate cancer. If someone actually goes in ICU, most of the doctors, they monitor lactate or in creatinine. So this is also actually a mortality biomarker. And then there are other biomarkers which are related to heart attack or stroke. So we, Using this particular device, we monitored multiple diseases simultaneously, and that also resulted in good uh, paper. So this is actually an actual picture of the device. So you can connect this particular device. Um, 
let me just uh, so this is handheld device you can see and this is the microchip and it can be connected to any android device so the, in this case we connected it to a tablet uh, but you can also connect it to any android based phone and a freeware is available on google play called multicolor dx you can also see it and using a battery of this android phone you can operate this device so it doesn't require any external battery it doesn't require external computational uh, memory you can say or the processing ability so the, <clears throat> this is the chip which is being used so you can see this is very traditional cmos chip but on top of this cmos chip every pixel had three sensors one was photodiode which looks at optical signal Second one is ion sensitive field effect transistor. So as the word suggests ion, it looks at individual ions which are looking, uh, which are present in the liquid. And then SPAD is also another photodiode actually. So these are different processing steps. So we created micro channels on top of this very tiny chip. So imagine this area, imagine this line is 300 micron. So the chip size is almost 3 mm by 3 mm or even smaller than that. And imagine creating micro channels on top of this device. It was really challenging. But in the end, we were able to detect four metabolites simultaneously using this particular chip. So the basic principle of operation is very similar to the photodiode. So you look at change in color. So imagine we used to shine a light by using LED which was integrated on panel. And this LED light used to pass through a solution in, on which, in which the assay solution was there actually. So traditionally, if you go in a laboratory, this assay solution is in terms of few millimeters. But on top of chip, it is extremely small, small volume. It is one or two microliter actually. So you can, within a span of five minutes, you can look at multiple biomarkers. So imagine these are biomarkers such as choline, xanthine, sarcosine, cholesterol. These were looked into buffers, but these are uh, being measured into serum and in urine. So at the end of these measurements, we look at two case studies. One was the samples which I received from Queen Elizabeth Hospital, actually from uh, Glasgow. And those were from the stroke patients and the sepsis patients. So they particularly look at lactate and creatinine. So imagine if you have anyone who is suffering from kidney diseases, the creatinine is one molecule which is looked at and the concentration of creatinine is extremely low, 70 micromolar to 150 micromolar. So if it goes beyond that, that means the person is suffering from the kidney disease. And the sensor should be able to monitor this creatinine actually. Lactate is another la mortality monitor. So lactate concentration should not go above one millimolar actually. So imagine, have you done or have you played cricket after multiple years, say after five years, then your arm really actually there is an unknown pain and that is because of presence of lactate. Many athletes, they cannot go beyond their performance because they are actually uh, obstructed by the production of this lactate. So many athletes, they have to increase their lactate intolerance. So lactate and creatinine, they are sort of monitored in ICU as sort of mortality biomarkers. So if they go beyond particular level, then it is really, really difficult to keep patient alive. So we developed this device to measure lactate and creatinine, and we were able to achieve almost exactly same result as the device which is measuring these biomarkers in clinical settings, actually. So in clinical laboratories. So imagine all these re results are obtained by handheld device, literally handheld device, by the size of your mobile phone. And the last study which we did was for prostate cancer patients. So imagine when you pass the age of 40 or 50, 
you feel the urge of frequent urination and this frequent urination is a result of increase in prostate gland in, in case of males. Uh, it could be also from urinary tract infection in case of females or also from males actually. But we were targeting males only in this particular purpose. So we received 40 samples from prostate cancer positive patients and 10 samples they were purchased from in healthy individuals. And we collaborated with Bitson Cancer Institute in Glasgow. And this work again resulted into uh, another nature paper. Uh, this was published early this year actually in Nature's Microsystems and Nanoengineering Journal. And we were able to look at these samples by using again handheld device. So imagine this is the handheld device which you can power by using smartphone. This is the data from non-prostate cancer patients. You can see this line is really low again. But if you look at on the right hand side, you can see this, there is some trend of increasing signal except from the sarcosine. And this is clearly indicated over this statistical figure actually. So you can see the signal in prostate cancer patients is higher than the healthy patient. So Imagine being able to quantify these biomarkers within five minutes and tell the diagnosis that if someone is prostate cancer positive or not. Otherwise, you have to go through multiple tests. One is sort of a rectal examination. So clinician actually inserts his two fingers from your back to know the size of Sign of size of your prostate actually, which is very intrusive. Not many people are comfortable with it actually. Otherwise, people go through prostate specific antigen tests, which is called PSA test. And there is possibility of many false positives or false negatives. So this was much more reliable, the selectivity or the trust level of this particular test was 95%. And this was quite good achievement, actually. Uh, this is actually how much time it takes for getting the signal. You can see the footprint of these sensors over here. You can see the bright region going into the darker one. And this is fast forwarded clip, which is reading the screen of the tablet. So you can see within the span of three or four minutes, you can look at very complicated devices by using a device which can be connected to your mobile phone. And this is really a way forward. People are, multiple research groups are moving into this direction actually. And there is actually very huge trend in this side. So this is actually the second generation device of the first one, which I showed. So the cartridge has gone through improvement and the look also. And this is the artist impression of the final generation device. So when this particular paper was published in 2018, uh, this became quite a huge news, almost around 36 countries actually. On 18th of September, I think uh, it received massive press uh, coverage actually in most of the countries. In India, it was published in Times of India, the Hindu in Asian age. So as an impact footprint of this particular work, we were approached by six companies for the commercialization of this device. Uh, we found another company, which is called Multicorder DX. I personally received a funding of 20,000 pounds actually for the clinical validation. The work which I presented is outcome of that. And now three companies are actively engaged for the commercialization of this device. And I would really now thank you for your attention and I will be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hello, sir. How are you? Is it okay? Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your nice session.
uh, I extend my uh, warm welcome to Prashant Saxena sir. Uh, we are moving toward uh, next session. Uh, let me introduce Prashant Saxena sir. <clears throat> Dr. Prashant Saxena is a uh, uh, guy for service there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So, my request, uh, Dr. Kedi Gaikwar, sir, please uh, provide a brief introduction about uh, Dr. Prashant Saxena, sir. Okay, sir. May I audible to you, sir? Yes, you are audible. Okay, good afternoon to all again and I again welcome you in the international webinar on futuristic devices from healthcare to quantum computing. Uh, it's a great honor to me to introduce our speaker of third uh, of this third session who is going to talk to us about the how fundamental mechanic health engineers, surgeons and rocket scientists. Uh, this subject in which we should all be deeply interested because from our day we are deeply interested in this subject and I would like to present or uh, giving brief introduction about uh, Prashant Saxena sir. Hmm. Prashant Saxena is a lecturer in the James Watt School of Engineering at the University of Glasgow since 2018. Uh, Prashant sir is in interested in understanding the complex behavior soft solids display due to the deformation under extreme multi-physics fields. Uh, Prashant sir has undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering from IIT Kanpur and has done PhD in applied mathematics from the University of Glasgow. He has received postdoctoral training from universities of Allingdon, Nuremberg and Lucerne. He has also worked as an assistant professor at Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad before returning to Glasgow. Uh, Prashant sir has received several awards for his work including uh, Ramanujan Fellowship from SCRB and gold medal in the Indian National Physics Olympiad. So all dear participants, please join me in welcoming Dr. Prashant Saxena sir. Over to you, Dr. Prashant Saxena sir. Um, <clears throat> thank you for this kind of introduction. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Very much audible. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a couple of requests. Uh, before I start to the audience, I can see there are a lot of students in the audience. Uh, please feel free to post your questions uh, during the talk in the chat. Or if you want to ask verbally, please go ahead and ask verbally. I will be very happy to take the questions as we move along. And also to the organizers, uh, just let me just tell me about the time five minutes before I am due because sometimes I tend to speak if I'm given the chance to speak. Okay, so uh, I'll just share my screen and let's see. Uh, yeah. Can you see the screen again? Just one last feedback. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh huh. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, how mechanics helps uh, scientists in a, in a very wide variety of fields. Um, so this is going to be less focused on uh, the results that we have in our lab, but more focused on, let's say, fundamental aspects. Um, more focus on fundamental aspects of, of, uh, of our research. Okay, so um, before I go, out, go and talk about my research, let me just talk a little bit about University of Glasgow. Uh, so this is where I am right now. This is where I did my PhD. And this beautiful building that you see is the main building at the University of Glasgow. 
let me see if I can get a pointer here. Okay. Uh, it's almost 200 to 250 years old. Uh, and you're very welcome to come to Glasgow in Scotland. It's a nice place to work, nice place to live, a nice place to visit, a nice place to study and do your academics here as well. Uh, the primary uh, uh, center that I work in Glasgow is the Glasgow Computational Engineering Center. This is a group of people who use computational methods so uh, to, to solve engineering challenges. Uh, and a very unique thing about University of Glasgow is our laboratory for academic culture. Um, uh, so this is this is a laboratory where uh, we do uh, people in general do research on how to be how to come up with a university culture uh, which benefits everyone. So very often we see that uh, university culture is dominated by certain biases of certain uh, individuals. Uh, which can prohibit or restrict certain people from achieving their full potential. And uh, a unique thing about Glasgow is that uh, if you are here, uh, we will always focus on your strengths uh, and the things that you know, rather than focusing on things that you don't know. Uh, so always look at the positive aspects of an individual and let them progress ahead. Uh, and if you are if you're looking to do your early your research, let's say your master's or PhD or postdoctoral research, or you want to establish as an academic here, there's an excellent support available for all, all people at the early stages of the career for doing research. Uh, I, I lead the mechanics of soft solids group at Glasgow. Uh, and our research is focused on, uh, as, as, as it says, mechanics of soft solids. Uh, and we, we focus a lot on multi-physics coupling. So what we mean by this is uh, materials or solids where uh, external fields play a, uh, play a role in the deformation. So for example, you can, you can have a system where you are deforming the system, I assume like a rubber band, if you're stretching a rubber band, but at the same time, what if uh, that rubber band can experience, uh, can recognize the surrounding magnetic fields and it can deform according to the magnetic fields? or it can recognize surrounding electric fields and it can deform according to electric fields uh, or maybe temperature fields. So this is what we mean by multi-physics coupling. And this is actually quite often seen in uh, many engineered systems, but also in many biological systems. For example, our heart uh, is, a, is a system which uh, has electromechanical coupling. So you can apply electric pulses to the heart to jumpstart the heart if somebody's heart suddenly stops beating, right? So electrical current, leads to mechanical deformation. So that is the kind of things that we're talking about. We study a lot of uh, biomechanics of soft tissues. So again, uh, soft tissues such as your organs uh, like heart, uh, blood vessels like arteries, uh, the skin, how does your skin deform? Uh, we, we have a, a big project going on looking at how do wrinkles appear on skin because of old age or uh, also because of mechanical deformation. Uh, uh, we, we spend a lot of time studying mechanics of slender structures. So slender structures are structures where uh, one dimension or two dimensions are less important than the other dimension. So for example, if you look at a sheet of paper, then in a sheet of paper, the thickness dimension is really small compared to the other two dimensions. So anything that happens to a sheet of paper would be in the two dimensions. The third dimension is something not so important or, or easily uh, understood. Similarly, if you look at the hair uh, on, your, on your head, then uh, it, it is essentially a one-dimensional object. So the reason for looking at uh, uh, structures or materials in this reduced dimensional format is because it helps you to understand, it helps you to make simpler models to study them and uh, your, your analysis or the mathematics that you need to understand them become simpler. And then we spend a lot of time on mathematical and computational methods. So these are our main tools. So unlike uh, in the previous talk, you see you saw that Dr. Patel showed uh, you a lot of uh, things that he fabricates in the lab. So he spends a lot of time in the laboratory. Whereas in our case, we spend a lot of time uh, on our desks or on our computers, trying to write mathematical equations and then trying to solve those mathematical equations using computers. So that's that's the bread and butter of what we do. Uh, a group is made up of 
primarily masters phd and postdoctoral uh, researchers at the moment we have two phds uh, and one postdoctoral researcher and by the end of this year we'll be almost double this capacity uh, and we have a significant amount of collaboration from people across the world uh, and we welcome newer collaborations for from uh, people who are interested in things that we do uh, and and the picture probably you cannot see it very clearly but the picture at the back is uh, is lake lomond it is a, a very beautiful place in Scotland, very close to uh, our university. So you just take a train uh, from university about 40 minutes, 50 minutes, you reach this location. So it's a nice place to come and, uh, come and live and study here. Okay, I see there are a uh, lot of students, so I just want to have one slide about them uh, and, and just want to show how science uh, happens these days. Uh, and I think it should be up soon, yeah. So. When, when I was a student uh, and we used to study physics or maths or anything, we always had these photos of uh, big people like Einstein, Newton, Ramanujan, C.V. Raman. And, and this was uh, the, the way science used to be done, let's say 100 years ago, or, or maybe more than that, that there was an individual person, very, very bright and very intelligent, sitting in the lab doing something and, and publishing papers and giving scientific theories. But, but that's not the way modern science works. If you see on the right, I think you may be familiar with some of these images. So this is an image of uh, scientists at ISRO celebrating a, a successful launch of a Chandrayaan mission. Uh, on, on the extreme right on the top, you see uh, this, is a, this is again a group of scientists at ISRO working uh, on, on uh, a launch mission. On, on the bottom left, you see uh, a group of scientists at NASA uh, uh, at the at the JP laboratory, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and on the extreme right hand side is a is a photo that I had taken uh, at IIT Hyderabad when I when I organized a scientific meeting. And I mean, this is how we do science these days. We just uh, stand together, talk about science. We can uh, write on the blackboard, uh, and it's just normal people like you and me. It's not it's not like uh, people like Einstein and Newton all the time. It's just like normal people, you and me, and. We, we, we work on this together. So uh, that's just one thing I wanted to make clear because this was not clear to me when I was a student. Uh, I used to think that scientist is something out of the world, but that's not the case. It's just like regular people. Okay, so moving on uh, to, to the topic that I have, applied mechanics in today's science uh, and, and how it works. Just a quick question, can you, okay, you see the slides a little later. So uh, I'll start from, from very, very fundamental uh, classical mechanics that uh, a lot of people might have studied either in their uh, school time or maybe in, in the first or second year of their undergraduate curriculum. Uh, but, uh, and instead of focusing on, on the things that you study, I just want to focus on the concepts uh, that we have. So the concepts that we really uh, want to understand is that you want to study a complex system. Let's say you, you are an engineer and you are trying to understand uh, how, how do vibrations happen in a car and how do I control the vibrations and how do I understand the vibration. So instead of looking at the complete car, you would probably come up with a, with a model, uh, a simplistic model that can describe the car. Uh, so a lot of you may be familiar with this model of spring mass damper system. It's very easy to write down the equations for the spring mass damper system. So even in, in a very complex system, like let's say mo movement of a rocket through space or vibration of a car, or, or let's say uh, uh, motion of uh, blood flow through your arteries or, or uh, vibrations of your heart, uh, let's say beating of your heart, we will end up doing the same thing. We will reduce these complex systems to simplistic models, uh, which are usually mathematical models. And we will write down appropriate mathematical equations for those models. So you, you, I, I assume that you can write down uh, equations of motion for spring or mass system. It would be very similar to that, uh, just with a few extra things. And then, and then uh, a very nice challenge comes in solving those mathematical equations. And this is where, uh, all the computational methods that we develop come in. Uh, because even though uh, we have computers uh, which are really good at doing things, 
uh, they just don't know how to do things. So you have to write computer programs to make them do things. And and a lot of our uh, lot of our work uh, time goes into converting these mathematical equations into a proper computer program and to 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 be able to get those get the results from those computer programs to and then and then interpret those those results in a more physical physical way right so uh, for so for example uh, the string mass system that i just showed here on the right is is a model for a lot of things so the same equations that we have from for the system can be used to study many many things like vibration analysis as i mentioned or maybe even for elastic deformation of a rubber band it is pretty much the same equation or even for electric circuits there are certain kinds of electrical circuits which follow the same harmonic law that that comes in from spring mass systems so the key takeaway that i want to take away from this slide is uh, what we do in fact what all scientists try to do is to reduce complex systems to simplistic models uh, to make your life easier and to understand those systems completely and this is what we do all the time uh, in in our in our mathematical or computational research so, so with this we so i can see somebody has raised a hand yeah please go ahead ask a question probably by mistake and they have raised the hand you can proceed sir okay fine uh okay so this was the the thing that we know from classical mechanics you maybe uh, so these spring mass or a pendulum kind of a thing but there is slightly small extension to that which is what we call as uh, continuum mechanics and this this kind of mechanics is used uh, to study mechanics of materials and structures uh, so let's see this this figure on the here and then i'll talk about it so this is something like an object it can be any object it can be uh, it can be a rubber band it can be your heart it can be your art it can be a skin it can be a rocket and the way we simplify the system is you have a system at some initial time which we call as the undeformed configuration and after some time it deforms into some shape it's as simple as that it goes from an undeformed to a deformed system and then we just do all the mathematical thing to to explain how that deformation happens uh, and that mathematical thing happens from this generalization of this classical physics to physics of these deformable bodies which is what we call as continuum mechanics or continuum physics and you can you can think of uh, two major factors which would tell you how this deformation happens one one thing is the properties of the materials that are inside and the second thing is the forces that you apply so for example if you're stretching a rubber band uh, compared to the same thing same hand stretching a steel rod you no know? so the steel rod doesn't deform at all but the rubber band can go and undergo very large deformation because they are of different material properties and similarly uh, uh, the amount of force you apply depend determines how much deformation happens so so these two things are the key factors here and, and typically the problems that we solve fall into these two categories which is what we call as the forward problem or the inverse problem so the forward problem is quite easy it says that if i tell you what the material is if i tell you what the forces are tell me how much deformation happens how how does system deforms uh, but the inverse problem is actually the more uh, engineering oriented problem so <clears throat> you you can have a problem that is i want to launch a satellite uh, through a rocket and i know that during the launch process a certain amount of heat comes into the uh, satellite during the launch process it experiences a certain amount of forces so this is these are things that we know and we don't want the satellite to deform uh, otherwise it will fracture it will break right so we know the upper bounds on the amount of deformation that we can have now tell me how do i design that satellite what are the materials that i should use where should i put those materials so that the satellite goes properly so that is what we call as an inverse problem and that is the more uh, important and more difficult kind of a problem that we have in this system in this mechanics of materials and structures i'll give you a few examples of how do we use this and then i'll 
maybe just give you one uh, detailed example. So this is uh, an example from a nuclear power plant. So in, in nuclear power plants, uh, typically what happens is uh, there is a core of the power plant and in that core, uh, the nuclear fission reaction happens where, where typically uran uranium or plutonium breaks down. Uh, and when it breaks down, it generates a lot of heat, uh, which is what we use uh, to generate electrical current, right? electrical power. Uh, so when it breaks down, it, it gives out a lot of radiation. Uh, and that radiation is absorbed by uh, these, uh, these structures that you see on the right hand side. This is, these are graphite bricks. So graphite is a very good absorber of, uh, of any nuclear radiation. Uh, so this is a picture taken from uh, a power plant in the UK. Uh, uh, and our, our department has a collaboration with uh, EDF Energy. Uh, EDF is a, an energy, um, big energy company in, in Europe and it operates a lot of power plants in the UK. Uh, but the, the main you know, challenge in nuclear power plants is that once you have uh, started the nuclear fission process, once the nuclear power plant has started, you cannot just turn it off and on again. Once it started, it has started and it will keep on going for tens of years, uh, maybe 40, 50, 60 years. Uh, and you need to know, uh, and you, you cannot just go inside and check how, how the nuclear power plant is behaving. So what, what the challenge that we, that we particularly uh, see is that these graphite bricks, uh, which are there, they, uh, they, they undergo a lot of uh, high temperatures and they undergo a lot of radiation. And because of this, they tend to develop uh, cracks inside them and they tend to break and fall apart. Uh, and, and, the, and we know that this will happen. Graphite, after some time, it will kind of break and, and so we need to replace them. But the question is, when do we do that? Uh, do we do it after 10 years or do, do we do that after 30 years? Because once you stop the, stopping the nuclear power plant is a very, very, very expensive process. You don't want to do that. So that's where modeling comes into picture. So on the right-hand side, you see a, a model. Uh, it's a, something that we call as a finite element model uh, where this red, kind, red region shows you the place where the, the fracture has happened because of certain radiations and because of uh, temperature. So if, we can, if we can model this process, depending on where a particular brick is, so if like this is a collection of bricks everywhere in the nuclear power, power plants, and we if we can see uh, how what kind of loads appear at a particular location, we can find out where the cracks will appear, and therefore uh, when to replace that brick or how how to replace that brick. And those decisions can be taken on. But the first thing to know is whether or not the crack will appear and when it will appear. So so these are the kind of simulations. These are the things that we can predict by very simple mechanics principles. So the principles of mechanics are still the same that force equal to mass into acceleration, all summation of forces equal to zero in equilibrium, all those, those principles of mechanics. Uh, but you just need to write them clearly in mathematical form and solve those mathematical equations on computers and try to interpret their results correctly. Another example that I can show is of, uh, this is from uh, aerospace in industry. So, the challenge here is um, you want to launch a satellite uh, and the satellite might have some antennas, it might, it might have some you know, uh, solar panels for power generation. It can have, it might have some very, and typically these antennas or solar power, uh, solar panels are very large flat structures, right? Uh, and if you have these very large flat structures, uh, it's very hard to put that structure onto a rocket and launch it directly. You want to have structures that can fold into a very small compact space and then put that small compact thing into the rocket and then launch it. And then when you reach into the space, you can open up all your structures. So this is uh, what we call as deployable space structures. Uh, so this is from, from one of my colleagues from Caltech who works with NASA. Uh, and what they have is essentially these structures, which are big and flat. So on the extreme right image, bottom right, you can see that the completely open structure is this big, but you can just roll it and fold it and uh, put it into a very compact shape. 
Now, the thing is, when you roll it and fold it and put it into a very compact shape, uh, those structures will experience very large amount of forces inside it. And if you have electronic components there, those electronic components might break. So you need to find out where those forces are maximum, where those forces are minimum, and how do I optimize the placement of all the electronics there so that the electronics do not break, the, the, the structure does not break itself. Uh, so, so, so those kind of problems are again addressed by, uh, by our, again, basic principles of mechanics of materials and structures. The same equations, same similar equations just need to solve, need to be solved for this particular system. Um, this is, uh, the next slide is about soft tissues. So on the left, uh, we have a cross section of a blood vessel, which is the artery that connects your heart to the rest of the body. The artery pumps the blood. Uh, it's basically a blood vessel that takes uh, blood from your heart to the rest of the body. What happens is uh, when you uh, have high cholesterol in your blood, the high cholesterol, uh, it tends to deposit fat in the inner walls of the artery. So in the inner walls of the artery, you'll have more fat deposition. And because of that fat deposition, uh, the, the amount of area that is there reduces. And because the area reduces, the pressure increases. This is uh, pressure is forced upon area. So, and when the, your blood pressure increases, uh, you are at a higher risk of getting heart attack. Uh, so what the, the standard treatment for that is, uh, you deploy stents in the heart. So you might've heard the word stent. So this, this mesh kind of structure that you see here is a stent in the, in the, in the artery. So it's a very, uh, it's a metallic uh, structure that goes, uh, goes into the heart, goes into the artery, then it expands and it sort of keeps the artery in place. It keeps the artery open so that the blood can flow through it. Uh, so now there are a lot of challenges uh, in this problem from an engineering perspective. So you can think that, okay, a surgeon would actually place that into the heart. And that is true, a surgeon would do that. But an engineer would actually design the stent. And an engineer would tell you where to put that stent correctly and, and how much force is to apply. So, so we need to, uh, if, if we are actually applying the forces on the, on the artery to expand the artery, we need to be clear that we don't apply a lot of forces, otherwise artery will fracture and you will, I mean, the person can die if an artery fractures, right? You don't, don't want the artery to, artery to fracture. You only want it to expand so that uh, the blood can flow through. Similarly, if, if you apply too little forces, then there will be no expansion of the artery, right? So that your, your surgery would fail. So, so those kind of decisions need to be taken. Uh, and again, those are taken by, by looking at force and mechanics kind of uh, study. Uh, can can the host please uh, mute other people? I can see some noise around. Yeah. So so we, we there's a lot of research that goes into uh, designing these tents uh, with biocompatible materials, uh, which can withstand all the forces for a long period of time. Uh, and so we need to understand not only the uh, the properties of the stent material that goes into uh, the, the let's say some metal that goes into making the stents. But we also need to understand the properties of the tissue of the artery. Thank you. So a lot of uh, research goes into understanding the properties of the tissue material, you know, soft tissues. Uh, how do they deform? Otherwise, you'll, you'll fracture them. On the right hand side is an uh, is a similar problem, but this is this time it's the skin. Uh, so it's a, it's actually simulation of the of the top skin on the top of your hand. Uh, uh, and what we are simulating here is with the with given properties of the skin, uh, how do wrinkles appear if we if I deform the skin? So if I have the skin, if you can see my video, and if I deform the skin, if I compress it, certain wrinkles will start to appear on the skin. Uh, and, and the reason we study this are multifold. Uh, one is that uh, as we grow older, our, our, the, the properties and the texture of the skin tends to change. And therefore wrinkles are more frequent in let's say older generation than, in, than younger people. So one thing is to understand the aging process itself that how do wrinkles appear and why do they appear? What kind of changes in the material properties lead to more wrinkles? So, so a lot of, you know, 
Uh, I have a colleague who works on that and uh, his work is funded by lots and lots of uh, beauty products industry because they want to make those creams and those gels which can reduce the amount of wrinkles. At the same time, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, newer, uh, uh, let's say, electronic products that are about to appear in the market, which would be uh, something like a patches on the, on your skin to monitor your biomedical vitals or maybe patches to do something else. And if you have patches on the skin, you want to design your patches such that they have the same properties as the skin. Uh, if, if, you, if you have certain deformation in the skin with some wrinkles appearing, you want the same wrinkles on the, on the material that you have posted on top of the skin. Otherwise, there will be a debonding and the, the, things will fall, the sticker will fall off essentially. So, so, so to study uh, and to design those systems, it's very important to understand the biomechanics of the tissue. And, and the way we study the biomechanics of tissue is pretty much using the same concept that I described earlier, using mechanics, uh, forces, uh, materials, and properties. Uh, then uh, a very promising area, uh, see, yeah, uh, these days is, uh, is the area of soft robotics. So there are, there are too many things here, uh, but what I want to essentially talk about is uh, but when we think about robotics, uh, at least uh, maybe 10 or 20 years ago, when we used to think about robotics, it was uh, big bulky metallic objects like Terminator, you know, uh, uh, all, all metal. Uh, but, but the thing is, with in, 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 in today's world, when we talk about futuristic robotics, we talk about soft robotic systems, which, which are because soft robotic systems are compatible with uh, a lot of uh, biological systems. So if you have a soft robotic system, you can, it, it's easy to interact with that system. It's easy to interact for that system with human beings or with animals that compared to let's say a fully metallic system that can, uh, that has a very different properties than human beings. So uh, here are certain uh, examples. So for example, on the right-hand side, uh, this is a gripper, a very soft gripper that can actually lift an egg yolk. So you can, if you if you use metallic systems to do that, it will just pierce through the uh, soft egg yolk and it will not be able to use, uh, lift it. But the soft robotic system made up of polymers and elastomers and hydrogels, this thing can actually interact with these soft system without damaging them and, and use them. So you can pick strawberries, you can pick egg yolk, you can pick these work with these very soft material substances using soft robotic systems. And, and in, in order for the soft robotics to work, uh, we need to understand how the, uh, how the mechanics, uh, understand their mechanics. And again, it goes back to classical mechanics. I'll show you one example uh, once this slide is visible. Uh, if I can make this work. See. Uh, yeah, okay. So this is uh, a paper published by a group from uh, Max Planck Institute in Germany. And you can see uh, the, the scale bar is just one millimeter. So this entire system is almost three millimeters in length. And as you change the direction of the magnetic field, uh, this system moves in, in a certain fluid. So it's a, it's a robot. It's just like a rectangular kind of a robot, but it just keeps on moving in, in uh, a fluid system or in a solid system by an external magnetic field. So we don't need to attach anything to the robot itself. It can, uh, so I can I'll just play this one more time. Uh, and the advantage of this untethered robotic systems is that they can you can send them into some, uh, let's say, for surgery inside inside the body, and you can up, use external magnetic field to guide the robot and maybe deliver some drugs or do some things. Uh, so it can do movement, swimming, and so on. Uh, and I can play the same thing here. So, so again, this this here uh, tells you the direction of the magnetic field and how it is applied. So we have we have 
partners and colleagues who, who uh, manufactured them in the lab and work with them in the lab. And we, we work on the other side of modeling and computations. So we try to find out ways to model them so that the design can be improved or newer designs can be allowed. Okay, so that's that. Um, so uh, given these examples, uh, yeah, I'll just uh, spend the last 10 minutes uh, or so that I have in, in talking about one, one detailed example from Cantina Mechanics. So what, uh, and this, this field of Cantina Mechanics is actually not something that is immediately fam familiar uh, if you have studied mechanics at, uh, in school because Cantina Mechanics is, is, a, is an extension of classical mechanics that we study. Uh, so, so the way we work is we basically, we have to describe uh, the body in mathematical terms, anything that we are studying, any, anything that is deforming as I showed in the previous examples of soft robots or skin or uh, satellite uh, satellites or anything or nuclear graphite rod, anything uh, that has to be described in a more mathematical terms. Uh, you know? And then uh, we are able to find out what are the balance laws. So balance laws are the, are the uh, physical principles that determine how things behave. So physical principles are like balance of momentum, balance of energy, balance of mass, you know, all these physical balance of angular momentum, all these physical principles, they come into picture. Uh, and these are again written in, in a more mathematical format for us to work with them properly. And, and the way mathematical uh, format is used is by uh, essentially the tools from differential equations and linear algebra. So we write all these things as a system of differential equations. And then those system of differential equations are converted into algebraic equations to put into the computer. Uh, a very important thing is constitutive relationships. So these are the, these are the uh, relationships that describe what is the material constituted of. So what is the material property? Uh, and this, what is the material property will determine the model that you will use. Uh, so let me just spend one minute talking about the use uh, appropriate choice of model. Uh, and this is a very simple example from, from physics that imagine if you uh, just imagine those high school problems in physics where you had to take a mass from a height one to height two and you would apply that change in the potential energy is MGH. Yeah? Uh, uh, so in that kind of system, you would assume that the earth, earth is a completely uh, flat horizontal thing and a height a mass goes from by height one to height two and the potential energy is MGH. In the same, same uh, physics course, you might have studied uh, how to find out the, the time period of Earth's orbit around the sun by using gravitational forces. And in those, uh, in those calculations, you would assume the sun and the Earth to be point masses and a point mass will go around another point mass, right? So the same Earth is being modeled either as a point mass or as a flat horizontal infinite surface depending on the problem that you're solving. And that is one of the fundamental principles behind uh, modeling that uh, we, we, the same system can be described by, a, uh, by different models depending on the context that we have. So depending on what we, have, what we want to do. So, so that's what uh, describes, uh, determines the, con the models and the constitutive relationships. So we describe a problem as a set of partial differential equations or PDEs as we like to call it. And, and the challenges that we typically have in this line of research is that how do we choose the appropriate mathematical model? So that's just what I described. Earth can be used, uh, described as either a point mass or a horizontal flat line. Uh, similarly, all systems can have multiple descriptions and how do you choose the appropriate mathematical model? Once you have the appropriate mathematical model, how do you uh, solve it using a computer? So computational solution, that's another important challenge in, in this line of research. And then uh, the third challenge is uh, solving inverse problems and using engineering design. So this is something that I said a few minutes ago that imagine you are told uh, you have to send a satellite up in the space 
during that process it will experience certain forces certain temperature fields certain magnetic fields how should you design that satellite so that it can withstand all those external forces where do you put the material where do you put what kind of material you have choice from infinite levels of materials you know so how do you design that Th that is what we call an inverse problem and then uh, as we move forward uh, in time uh, we uh, the engineers and scientists keep on designing newer materials newer mechanisms and so we need to with these newer materials being manufactured your, uh, we need to keep on updating the models and we need to make keep making new models so these are the kind of challenges you can expect in in this area of research so just one final example uh, which has a little bit of more detail uh, so remember that robot that i showed you with the videos so is this some somewhat similar to that uh, uh, how if, if you have if you're given a system like that how do we model a system like that so modeling of electromagnetomechanics and and the key principle that we use is the principle of energy minimization so you would write the total energy of the system which would look like this very large mathematical expression this is the only mathematical expression i have in the entire talk but uh, and then you would essentially say that the system so this is a principle from physics which says that any system would tend to minimize its total potential energy so it can deform into a particular shape but that particular shape is not arbitrary it will deform into a shape that will minimize the energy so we'll, we'll minimize this energy uh, and determine get the appropriate equations that we need to solve to get the final deformation and the way we do that uh, uh, is using this uh, what we call as finite element method and its variants you might have seen this kind of images before where a system is discretized into these grids uh, so what happens is uh, if you want to solve a, a differential equation over a very large space it's very hard but it's much easier if you just break it down into very lots of small small domains which we call as finite elements and then once we break it down into small elements, we convert those differential equations to algebraic equations because these elements are small. We can do that. And then computers can, the thing is computers can only handle discrete systems. Computers cannot handle continuous systems. You know, computers work in, work, computers work in zeros and ones. So therefore, we need to convert differential equations to algebraic equations so that the computer can actually solve it. So this is uh, actually not a random thing. It's a it's a it's a design of a speaker that we had uh, that uses piezoelectric coupling. So piezoelectric coupling is piezoelectric materials are materials which can uh, produce electric uh, fields due to mechanical deformation, and inversely they can produce mechanical deformation during electrical fields. Uh, so again, I, I can see somebody has raised their hands. If you want to ask a question, please go ahead. Uh, maybe not. Okay, so so this is a design of a piezoelectric speaker, and when we when we do this mathematical thing, and when we convert everything into uh, mathematical equations, into differential equations, to algebraic equations, and solve it, this is the kind of solution that we typically obtain. So this is a solution from a recent paper, uh, where you can see how the speaker vibrates, and the way it vibrates tells you what kind of sound it will produce, uh, and therefore you can code that uh, vibration to, uh, to electric electric signal and, and therefore you can produce a sound that you want. Okay, so with this, uh, I'll just close the talk. Uh, I'll thank you for your attention and inviting me and please feel free to ask any questions. Uh, among the participants, if you want to ask any question, uh, please feel free to ask any question. Prashant, if no one is asking, let me take this liberty to ask you a question. Sure, sure, please. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm quite in interested, uh, actually, as much as everyone over here, which are other factors or which are all the factors which affect the wrinkling of our skin, actually? Which are the factors? Okay, so uh, that's a nice thing. Uh, 
So wrinkling is something. Uh, so there, there are several things. One is our skin is composed of multiple layers. Uh, so and and typically the top the topmost layer is uh, very stiff, and the layers below that are quite softer. And then you have flesh below that. So, so it's, a, it's like a very heterogeneous microstructural system. And on top of that, uh, these these are not uh, uniformly homogeneous isotropic systems. We have uh, lots of fibers inside them of different types. Which can interact with them. So the two major factors that that affect wrinkling are how those fibers are distributed, uh, which is which are typically we call it the collagen fibers. How they are distributed, the direction that they are, uh, and uh, and their, their intensity, and also what is the difference between the uh, stiffnesses of the top layer and the bottom surface? So typically, you may you may think that uh, the same skin can your own skin can behave differently in colder climate compared to hotter climate, and that's because of uh, because in colder climate it tends to become drier, and when it becomes drier, it becomes the top layer becomes stiffer, and therefore it behaves differently. So so. So these are the two major factors I would say influence the wrinkling. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting, actually. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Prasant Saxena, sir, for your uh, nice talk. And uh, I hope uh, all the participants enjoyed this talk. And uh, uh, we should move for the next talk. Uh, Samadhan Patil, sir. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar Jha is there. Probably not yet, actually. So I cannot see Sanjeev around, actually. He might be locking in. OK, so we will wait for uh, one minute. What we will do is, uh, I will try to fill up the time until Sanjeev comes over actually. So you can see that most of us are from electronic background. The host department is from electronics. I am in electronic engineering department. Sanjeev is in electronics. Prashant is very closely related to electronics. The word electronic itself, I think it was born at multiple places actually. And there is very interesting story behind that. Uh, there was a person who was student, but then he went on to become Nasir. Oh, thank you, Nasir. Uh, so there was a professor called um, Ambrose Fleming and he was in UCL, actually the current department of Sanjeev actually. So that used to be called electrical technology department. And he was the person who was responsible for first trans transatlantic transmission of the signal from London into US actually. And uh, there will be prizes. Actually, if someone guesses it correctly, I will put it from my pocket. If there is a quiz, which company, which company was responsible for the first Transatlantic signal transmission. So you have a chance to win the prize. Oh. You can raise your hand, you can write in a chat box. Okay, let Which me company? enable chat box. Okay. You can write in a chat box which company was responsible for the first transatlantic signal transmission. So anyway, I mean, since there was no reply from anyone else, I will just tell it. So it was Marconi Wireless Transmission Company. Marconi. Yeah, so Marconi. So Marconi was the one which paired up with Edison later on. And then uh, actually Professor Ambrose Flaving, he also was responsible 
for the birth of this particular term actually because he I, I developed think, one so, sorry to interrupt you uh, samadhan so, sanjeev is already i think here but he's not okay, able to okay perfect unmute. perfect he's not I able to unmute him. himself can you ask uh, Hi Sanjeev, can you hear us? Uh, he, can you see? Can, can the host I, can the host unmute him? I think he is not able to unmute himself. Hi there, can, Hi you, there. Hear can you hear me? Yes, yes, Sanjeev. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Come on! What have you done? You didn't let me speak. <laughs> wait, wait, hang on. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. You are audible now. Can you hear me? Yes, Sanjeev, sir. You are audible now. Audible now. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. So I am really going through a technical issue, and somehow, so if you just give me few more minutes, I will be able to start my presentation. Uh, just two minutes. So what is happening? The my. <clears throat> Okay, I will I will move to my PC at the moment. I'm in my laptop. I, my presentation is in my PC. So, if I log in again, and if you can unmute me, then so. so okay, no problem at all, sir. Yeah, just two minutes. Join me. So we can let uh, introduce you to our participants. Okay. Uh. So. May I? Yeah. Okay, just a moment. So I am going uh, to. Sir, till that, uh, till that, uh, there is one question from a participant side. Uh, if in technical issue will be solved, so till that we can have the question. Uh, sir Nasir, sir is asking, do you think IoT sensor inside the package of manufacturing food will be able to reduce the risk factor? For cardiovascular disease, especially in order to identify the consumption of salt. Uh, sir, Prashant Sakshina, sir, uh, probably this question is for you. Are you getting, sir? I, I think Samadhan will be better. Yeah, involved. I think this is for me. Uh, okay. I think uh, one thing is Internet of Things is about communicating the data from sensor to multiple sense servers so of course like uh, there are multiple sensors which which am i mean okay so there are already the sensors which can look at salt concentration or different things in a food and they are connected to food level so of course this will help to avoid the risk those who are at those who are at risk actually particularly patients which have high blood pressure or stroke they can definitely save their life yeah that can be done it is very doable actually and it is happening right now yeah uh dhananjay vasikar sir uh, you have raised your hand do you have any questions sir vasikar sir Sir, yeah. Uh, sir, my question is: Recently, there is a new that there is a wireless electricity. Now, how the sensors are used in case of that wireless electricity? Hello. Yeah, yeah. Your question is okay. Uh, Samadhan Patil sir. Uh, Vasekar sir, actually, so wireless electricity is nowadays around and multiple people or multiple applications are there around wireless 
uh, electricity, for example, wireless chargers, which are available on airports. So you, you need not have to connect your phone. You just have to place your phone on top of the induction hob. So mostly there are coils which are there and the coil based mechanisms are there to sense the presence of object. Uh, the simplest example is the induction hob. So there are multiple induction hobs in the market and they can precisely locate if the pot is sitting right on top of the hob or not. So this sensor can tell that whether the pot is there. So if there is no pot, then it won't start hitting at all. So it is called proximity sensing or induct inductance-based sensing actually. So there are already the sensors in the market to sense the proximity of the object in, in terms of its vicinity with the source. Okay. I, uh, I hope, yeah. I hope, I hope uh, Vasaikar sir, you uh, you got the answer. Uh, you are muted. You are saying something, but we can't hear you. Hello, sir. Yeah. But they use the towers. Now, how the towers are working in case of that wireless electricity? Sorry, I couldn't hear you very clearly. Vasaika, sir, I couldn't hear you very clearly. Hello. Yes. In uh, in video, they say that they use the towers for the transmission of electricity. Is the wireless electricity. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Exactly. Okay. So basically, you are asking related to there are many WhatsApp videos which are going around and they claim to be use of power in New Zealand. But actually, this particular technology goes back all the way to Nikola Tesla. So Nikola Tesla was the first person to visualize this powerless, miss, gridless transmission of power. I, I consider myself not a subject expert into that field. Uh, I think someone else who works in this area will be more appropriate person to answer in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sir, another question from Nasir, sir. Uh, do you think IoT and smart sensor will be able to replace many jobs and careers in medicine in the near future? Uh, Nasirji, it is actually becoming a reality. So it is definitely replacing the jobs, but it is also creating another set of jobs, actually. So it is actually two things happening at the same time. Uh, I don't know if you know about uh, Tesla car or Tesla Giga factory. So if you look at the documentaries which are related to the production of the Tesla cars, they use Internet of Things and sensors very, very efficiently. And you can see in that factory, you will not see any welder doing the welding. All the welding is done by robots. The proximity sensing is done by robots. The quality of the welding is done by machine learning. So you can see that, yes, it is replacing the jobs in manufacturing industry. In medicine, can it happen? Yes, it can happen, but it can also create multiple jobs. So there is this area of uh, drug development. And in drug development, you have to screen thousands and thousands of compounds at the same time. So sensors with machine learning can expedite drug development, actually. So imagine out of, if one company produces 1000 molecules in one year, if, or if multiple companies produce 1000 molecules in one year, only one molecule, only one molecule manages to go into the market as a drug. So this is 0.1% efficiency. So with sensors and internet of things, this can improve the efficiency in 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 you can say in future and yes it can affect jobs it can create more jobs and it can reduce few jobs thank you nasir very good question actually okay so i think we should move for the next session so ladies and gentlemen now let us move toward uh,
last session of our webinar uh, from dr sanjeev kumar jha he is going to talk on uh, on chip quantum laboratories uh, so it is my pleasure to introduce dr sanjeev kumar jha who is an academic uh, pi at the department of electronics and electrical engineer engineering in university college london united kingdom and recipient of united kingdom research innovation future leader fellowship uh, he did his phd from delhi university in 2006 uh, publication of 52 research papers are on his uh, credit and also he is a member of uh, member and assistant editor of ieee stranger publication uh, his research group quantum engineering laboratory is leading, is leading the research in the quantum phenomena in low dimensional semiconductor nanostructures at extremely low temperature and high magnetic fields uh, his group uh, current uh, his group's current research activities are on uh, fractional quantum hall effect quantization in one dimensional electrons topological phenomena and quantum computing uh, i kindly request to dr sanjeev kumar sir to deliver his speech on uh, on chip quantum laboratory so can you next voice will be of uh, dr sanjeev kumar jha sir can you hear me yeah okay you are audible right perfect so let me share i am just seeing here eagle can you still hear me Oh God! Uh, probably, sir, you should mute one device at least. Okay, okay. I think that's what I'm trying to do. Just, Just a moment. moment. It's a mess here. Yeah. Okay. Can you still hear me? Yes, you are audible, but the voice is not clear. Right. Can you hear me now? Uh. Voice is not clear. Sanjeev, Sanjeev, we can hear you, but the law is actually voice is really loud. Actually, okay, okay, voice is not loud. So, so then, did you say that? Yeah, it is loud, or it is actually uh, going through a squeaking. So it is on probably maximum level. Okay. Okay. okay don't worry okay. i have to manage somewhere else sorry about sorry. the complication and right okay so what happened when i <laughs> started doing it somehow my uh, computer stopped working and i it was mess in the morning so uh, i i hope everybody can hear me now yeah am i audible now Yes, sir. You are audible very much, very much. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. You are audible. You are audible. Okay. Sorry about the mess. So I am going to start my presentation. And uh, bum, bum, uh, where is the share? Right. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see. Okay. Great. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to give a talk uh, in this uh, webinar. So, thank you very much for a very nice uh, introduction uh, regarding the work that uh, we are doing at UCL. So, basically, when I was approached by Samadhan to give a talk, I was not sure what to speak because. Uh, because we wanted to kind of speak something which is common and 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 well known in the field being a very specialized field uh, i thought maybe it is worth we we collect something which is which is a state of the art and also very uh, interesting to 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 young people so i thought maybe uh, maybe something which is linked to the uh, futuristic technology which uh, probably most of you know 
is based on uh, quantum technology. So what we do uh, in our lab at UCL is uh, we do fundamental quantum physics of low dimensional systems uh, uh, in very uh, narrow range of parameters. And um, after investigating the very fundamental aspects of electrons dynamics or transport, we then see whether this can be you know, utilized for future quantum driven technologies. So in today's presentation, uh, I would like to uh, show you some of the fundamental discoveries that we have made in the past several years in our laboratory uh, at UCL. And uh, also I would like to uh, give you some uh, quick uh, glance of how these investigations and results may be utilized for, uh, for quantum uh, applications and as well as for topological uh, phenomena. And uh, if you have any questions, just stop me and I will be able to uh, answer your question. So, uh, right. Before we understand the, and talk about the results, it is important that, um, that we, see how electrons basically behave in solids. Uh, as we all know that electrons in a three-dimensional system can change its momentum in all possible directions. So uh, the, uh, let me use the, so uh, the one which I'm pointing to is a bulk. So it's a cuboid, you may say. And here, the, uh, the momentum can change in any possible direction, x, y, and z. This is a famous textbook example, which I'm sure all of you have gone through. Uh, and so the density of states can be projected that way. Now, if we take a slab of this cuboid, just take a, take a knife and cut a slab, then we would come up with something like this, a slab which has X and Y and Z direction is very minimal. So this is a quantum well structure. So what is a quantum well structure is that electrons in that structure can move along X and Y direction, but Z direction is not allowed. So that is, I would say is quantized. So if you, if you take the dispersion relationship along this direction, then how, this is how it looks like. So you have density of states allowed, but they are not allowed here. So basically what happens, as we know, electron has a maximum energy, which is known as the Fermi energy. If the maximum energy of electrons in this system is less than the gap between these two states, all the electrons will sit in the ground state of, of quantum well structure, quantum well system. So basically when they sit into the ground state, they, they form a kind of two-dimensional electron gas. This is how a two-dimensional electron gas is formed. So literally it is not, the meaning of gas does not mean that it is a gas, it means that they are non-interacting particles and there are so many there, but they are sitting in the ground state and they may be interacting to each other, may not be depending on the environment they are in. So from this two dimensional system, we can create a one dimensional system as well. So here the electrons were able to move in X and Y directions, but Z was not allowed. Now let us take one more, uh, take a cut here. So electrons can change their momentum and velocity along, along this direction, but they are not allowed in the rest two directions. So the density of states for electrons in such one dimensional system is like that. So it's something like you have a spiky behavior. This is very interesting. If you try to imagine uh, in, when you have density of states like that, the, 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 and if you were measuring the resistance of a system, then you would have a state where you would see resistance, then you would not see resistance. Some, you would see, you wouldn't see that. So this dispersion relationship, we will exploit in the subsequent slides, slides to see how the resistance or conductance in such one dimensional system uh, looks like. And when the electrons are completely quantized so that they are unable to move, they form a quantum dot, something like that. They're fully quantized from three possible directions. And when you have, then this is the particularly uh, the density of states for that system. But I will not talk about the quantum dot uh, thing today. So what I would be showing you today is the results based on quantum wires or one dimensional systems 
where electrons can move only along a line. They can change their momentum only along a line and no other directions are allowed. And what is the best system to create a, a one dimensional system? Out of various like metals, semiconductors and insulators, the best choice for such investigations is, is semiconductors. As we all know, and semiconductors provide us with, with extremely important property of modulating the density of electrons in there. And, and, and that is only possible when semiconductors are in mesoscopic regime. So basically, what is a mesoscopic system? So mesoscopic system um, is a Greek word, as probably you know, which typically, which means that, that, that the system contains large number of particles, which is reminiscent of a classical system. Uh, despite having large number of particles, they are very special in the sense that they show quantum characteristics of those particles, which constitute a mesoscopic system. So what is the meaning of quantum behavior of that system is that you would start seeing energy quantization of the system and also the if because when 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 something is quantum they would have a wave function so they would they would come and 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 start interfering with each other constructively and destructively and that would that phenomena would be would be visible in addition to that in a mesoscopic system when you have several particles uh, together then then also they may start interacting with each other when they do so then then a then a concept of many body effects come into play which uh, which is something very interesting uh, effect one of the interesting effects that that we investigate in our system and i would be showing you the results based on that uh, in subsequent slides now this is about the mesoscopic system what which, which material system should be used for for such kind of thing material system in the sense uh, which material should be utilized for for realizing mesoscopic system out of several systems ah so i'm skipping one probably you know that there are two approaches of top down and bottom up approaches so so basically when you have a top down approach which means you can create a nanoscale devices by patterning of semiconductors and bottom up as the name suggests you create net nanostructures naturally via some kind of self assembly or growth process like carbon nanotubes nanoparticles etc so out of the two approaches of device fabrication of mesoscopic devices we particularly rely on the top down approach where we do the nanoscale fabrication of a of a fabricated uh, material like uh, a, a, on a wafer and then we go down and, and create our, our, our samples or devices. One of the uh, well established techniques that we that we utilize for the creation of devices is molecular beam epitaxy and the material of interest for us is gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide three five compound semiconductors. Uh, one of the conditions for investigating quantum behavior in a system, in a system in the sense in a material system is that the, the, uh, the material qual quality must be extremely high. If material quality is not extremely high, you cannot measure quantum behavior because the, the impurities in the system would degrade the quantum behavior because for quantum behavior to be seen, the mean free path of electrons must be sufficiently large in the sense when electron is propagating in the system, it must travel some distance before it collides with some other existing system or with the boundaries. So what we want and what we must have in our system is that the, the, the mean free path of the system is, should be sufficiently large for electron to exhibit ballistic behavior uh, through the through the through the device as they propagate and as well as the the, the material must be, must be highly pure and gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide is a well established uh, one of the well established material system or i would i would say the well established material system which uh, has been uh, utilized for for such kind of uh, quantum investigations for more than 30 uh, years so uh, the early discoveries which were conducted 
or done in solid states physics, something like uh, Hall effect, quantum Hall effect, fractional quantum Hall effect, and uh, and uh, metal insulator phase transition. They were all done, including uh, quantum dots using gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide systems. The the reason is, as I stated before is that they provide you a platform where you can really look into the true quantum behavior without worrying about the existence of impurities scattering centers around so you can trust your data because you have hardly any uh, any um, you know impurities or defects in your system which would perturb your quantum mechanical behavior so we will stick with gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide and uh, and in such systems the mobility has been seen as high as high as 40 million uh which is tremendously high so i do not know how would you gauge this value so 40 million is something like electrons travel through the system ballistically like a rocket and there is no collision it experiences or the experiences as they traverse through the system means they are ready for 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 uh, quantum mechanical um, uh, exploitation right so uh as I mentioned, molecular beam epitaxy uh, is a technique which is a well-established technique which has been utilized extensively for the growth of high-quality semiconductors. So on the right-hand side, there is a plot which shows as a function of temperature, how does the mobility increase? So in, in early or late 70s, the mobility was hardly like 10,000 uh, value. And now today's current state of art is around 40 million so, so the system uh, is pretty clean and, and a variety of new quantum mechanical phenomena can be seen. So one of the examples I can give you in the uh, early 80s, when the fractional quantum Hall effect was discovered, the mobility at that time was something like 20 to 30,000 uh, uh, centimeters square per volt per second. And that time uh, the fractional states which were observed were hardly two and three uh, so till today more than 150 fractional states have been seen uh, in the fractional quantum hall effect investigations and so you may appreciate that cleaner the system is more new fractional quantum behavior can be seen still people are working on on improving the quality of the materials and i'm i'm sure that we can see several more uh, effects uh, as the system is more cleaner. How a two-dimensional system is created? So it's a very simple thing. Probably I sh can avoid it. Uh, let's see. So in a, in a, in a gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide heterojunction, what happens? Uh, growers, they first grow something on the on this side, you have an L gas layer, aluminum gallium arsenide, which is done over the gallium arsenide layer. They have different band gaps and being different band gap. So they would have definitely a band bending when you bring them closer. So on this side, this is the band diagram when they are sitting on the top of each other. So because of that, what we do, this is undoped and and, and aluminum gallium arsenide is doped with silicon and because of the uh, equilibrium uh, energy attained between the two systems. So this is the Fermi energy and they would become similar to maintain the alignment of ener Fermi energy electrons from the L gas side would move towards this triangular well. And there they form two dimensional electron gas. And this is what we will exploit for. So just to reiterate again, uh, at the interface of gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide, a very thin layer of electrons coming from the aluminum gallium arsenide get accumulated over there, okay? And this is the electron rich regime that we utilize for fundamental quantum um, investigations. Um, right, so just bear with me. I don't want to, remember. I can't see the mic, how to, yeah, that is. How can I remove this top tab? Wide video panel. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. Right. So uh, I'll go back to the second slide where I had shown to you um, the uh, this one, uh, the how a two D is formed, and uh, and uh, 
So now uh, if, let's see how a one dimensional quantum wire is created when you have a two dimensional electron gas formed at the interface of gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide. So for the, for the one dimensional quantum wire to be formed, uh, the electron mobility must be very high as we know it is very high and the electron must exhibit ballistic transport. Uh, how much time do I have if I may ask? You can take it. Okay. okay. Right. So uh, for the for the one dimensional electron uh, uh, transport to take place, so we uh, this is something I've shown you here. So imagine that as in the previous slide, I showed how it elect how a two dimensional electron gas is formed. It forms at the interface of gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide. So you may assume that this this cuboid that you have, uh, which is kind of grayish. So somewhere um, here you have. In an interface of gas, aluminum, gallium arsenide, gall gallium arsenide, and aluminum, gallium arsenide. On the top, we put two gates in yellow. And if we apply negative voltage on the gate, electrons underneath, which is in blue, would be depleted, obviously. But if, if, you, if you continuously increase the, the, the negative voltage on these two gates, electrons, even between the, between the two, like here, would subsequently start depleting. depleting. And as they get depleted, what happened? We enter into a, a very interesting quantum regime. So this is the source side and that, that is a drain side. So electron propagate through this small narrow region, which forms like a point contact. So electron has a wavelength, as we all know. So when the electron wavelength is such that the, the, the wavelength of electron is more than this so-called regime between the two gates, then it will pass from here towards the drain side, source to drain side, ballistically without any scattering. And once it is achieved, then we have entered into the uh, into the one-dimensional quantum regime. And and what happens when we have entered into the one-dimensional quantum regime uh, will be shown uh, here. So basically, what happens? The we measure conductance of this system. So, so you source is here, drain is there. So we measure conductance of this tiny region between the two. Conductance is nothing but the reciprocal of resistance. So since this is a quantum mechanical system, the conductance is given in the units of two e squared upon h, h e is charge of electron and h is the Planck's constant. And this factor, which is it's a mathematical term, if you want to ignore it, you may, but this is showing you T alpha beta something. So this is nothing but the transmission of various modes which are passing through the narrow regime. In simple terms, you can understand the, the conductance of the small, tiny, narrow region, region as, as G equal to N times two E squared upon H, where N is the number of subbands of one dimensional electron formed in that small territory and if there are five, the total conductance of the region of that narrow region would be five times two e squared by h. This is how it looks like. So if you measure, so this, these two black line uh, squares that you see are nothing but the these yellow gates on the top. And if you apply negative voltage on these two gates simultaneously, and you have source and drain on these two sides, and if you focus on the inset here, so if, if you apply negative voltage on these two gates, so here you have the voltage becoming negative. So what happens? The conductance starts dropping. And, and after a while, when, they, when the split, the voltage on these two gates, which are called the split gates, is sufficiently negative, then you may start seeing some kind of steps, very interesting steps. And this is a zoom out of, of that step regime. And if you see this zoom out, it shows beautiful steps. And you may wonder what these steps are. They may be some kind of some kind of issue with the measurement. Actually, not. They are beautiful, real quantum mechanical effects. So, as I mentioned in the last slide, the conductance of the system is given as n times two e squared by h. N is the number of allowed subbands or modes through the system, and two e squared by h is the conductance. So here, what we can see, 
conductance is given in units of 2 square by h and these are the different 1d subbands subbands of the one dimensional electrons so the height is equal to 2 square by h so how many steps are there roughly if i say 1 2 3 4 5 there are some something like 20 subbands so this depends on the quality of the material so this published this paper was published in 1998 so you can may imagine even that time the material quality was tremendously high that they were able to observe or or, or i would say mm, uh yeah they would they were able to observe 20 subbands within the one dimensional system which is a remarkable feat they did that time so th that means you can clearly see the true quantum mechanical phenomena in the laboratory using a is using a system which is composed of gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide based two dimensional electron gas formed at, at, at their interface and then you simply put two gates on the surface apply negative voltage as you apply negative voltage you are making your two dimensional electron gas to eventually become one dimensional as they become one dimensional you start seeing true quantum mechanical phenomena so this is the essence which i wanted to show to you and what happens when you apply a magnetic field in the system? So I'm, I'm sure you know the influence of magnetic field. What happens when we apply a magnetic field to a system? If you apply a perpendicular magnetic field, we all know from the textbook that uh, electron would start taking a circular orbit. Okay, that is called cyclotron radius. And, and, um, and as you increase the magnetic field, accordingly your cyclotron radii would change. Now, what happens when you apply not a perpendicular, but in plane field? In plane means to say along the same direction as the transport direction, in the sense towards the in the same line as source and drain. When you apply in plane magnetic field, you are not bothering the orbital motion of electron. Electron will not take any circle. Okay. So you would affect only the spin momentum of electron. So this is what we do. We apply in, in plane magnetic field without affecting the orbital motion because we want to exploit what happens or we want to investigate what happens when 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 spin is influenced in such a system so let's try to understand what happens so if you may focus on um, uh, on this uh, right hand um, uh, system so what these uh, parabola show so basically you have two parabola here do bottom and top so the uh, and 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 these the, these are nothing but in in the momentum space okay so your momentum space as a function of energy so what happens i think probably i missed to tell you uh, quickly i can show you so the you the 2 e square by h the conductance the factor of 2 comes from the spin degeneracy in the sense electron spin can be up or down okay it is equal possibility of electron spin to be there along these different subbands so because of the probability distribution of electron so we assign a factor of 2 to conductance of electron in that particular subband so now as i say when the, the the factor of 2 is because of spin degeneracy so which is drawn here in this cartoon that your spin can be up and down so this is one subband and you may consider this as corresponding to the first conductance step 2 e square by h 4 e square by h 6 e square by h so spin up spin down is there in each subband uh, okay so what happens when you apply a bit of magnetic field sorry uh so these spin become polarized basically so there is a gap created between the two spin because you are putting an external energy to the system so a gap is produced between the two so try to understand from this this plot here on the right hand side so we have uh, conductance appearing in units of at zero magnetic field tesla is the unit of magnetic field at zero magnetic field we have conductance plateaus appearing at 2 e square by h 4 e square by h and 6 e square by h which we know why it happens but as the magnetic field in plane magnetic field is increased you may start seeing there are half plateaus appearing corresponding to half of this value e square by h 
3 e square by h and 5 e square by h and why do they occur because your spin of the system is now becoming polarized because of the polarization of the system electrons they try to align based on their energy which is either spin down or spin up and this is a plot which is called the transconductance plot of the data shown below so what you do that you take the differential of your data and plot it with respect to the one of the parameters in the system so we have plotted this uh, on the y-axis you have magnetic field and on the x-axis you have the voltage that is applied on the pair of split gates so why we do this uh, plotting is that we try to understand uh, things more clearly when we do the differential transconductance plot so without going in that technical detail the essence of this slide is that by applying in plane magnetic field you can manipulate spin momentum of electron precisely so in the beginning in the absence of magnetic field your conductance is like that after the application of magnetic field your conductance has become like that so you may tune spin down and spin up of, of electron and which will have which has tremendous application for spintronics uh, usages right so what is this okay so this slide we have how a typical uh, device that we measure in the laboratory looks like so this has already been sh uh, shown but in this uh, particular uh, schematic you may notice that so we have nothing but source on this side drain on the other side and these things in orange they form the pair of split gates which was shown in yellow in, 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 in the previous slide where I introduced the concept of one dimensionality and try to see these orange gates are there. And then on the top of these orange gate, there is a gray color of dielectric and over the dielectric, there is a top gate. So what we do with this top gate, so this top gate provides you with uh, a, a tunability of carrier concentration within the system means electrons flow from source towards drain when they form a one dimensional channel when the wavelength of electron is more than the, the 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 region that is created here that on that particular occasion we all then apply some voltages on the top gate to 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 tune the carrier concentration in that particular narrow region to understand many body effects or interaction effects in the system we'll talk about that in a moment so this is one of a typical device structure that we have so as i mentioned split gates there are examples of three split gates here so the scale is not visible here but i can tell you this tiny uh, gap between these two lines is 400 nanometer by 500 nanometer okay and this on the right hand side there is a there is a and there is a micrograph of a split gate over which there is a top gate so this is the top gate and that thing is the rectangular thing is your polymer which is that one and above the polymer there's a top gate so this is a top gated split gate device this is a schematic of the the the, the wafer that is grown it's a, it's a delta doped wafer and electron gas two dimensional electron gas is sitting somewhere here 300 nanometer from the surface almost 300 nanometer and on the top pair of split gates in orange this gray thing is your dielectric and the orange thing is your top gate we will see how this device behaves so typically this is a chip carrier and you may see that there is a device in here which is bonded to these different pads and we will see exactly everything clearly so this is a again an scm image of a device which is bonded okay and uh, and uh, we convert this this chip into a hall bar and uh, something like this geometry we etch it out after etching out then we put all the gates along these lines these are ohmic contacts ohmic means linear contacts and to, to make gates we put metals over it so they metal go and then uh, uh, they rise the, this wall and then they stay there i will show you how it looks like so this is again a micrograph which is showing a pair of split gate you may notice there is a gap there these are split gates to form a 1d wire and this is another example of a pair of split gates and and this is the top gate that thing and this is a blow up to show you exactly that there is a gap 
between the two and there's a top gate and in between the top gate and the split gate there is a polymer right okay how do we do experiments so these are the systems that we use so one of the system where they're, they're pretty much the same system it's a cryostat cryostat means this can cool down your device to extremely low temperature down to tens of millikelvins so these systems have a very large magnetic field it's called in situ superconducting magnet is placed in there in both the systems so this system then then the one i'm showing to you can provide a maximum magnetic field of 12 tesla and that one can provide a maximum field of 14 tesla one tesla is 10,000 gauss so you can imagine what a strong field we can create and polarize electrons for various fundamental investigations so just to reiterate minimum temperature that we can achieve is around 10 millikelvin and field that we can apply is up to 14 tesla right do you is there any time limitation or, or should i continue uh, sir, basically, we are moving out of the schedule now. Hmm. Sorry, uh, how yeah, much time? Uh, uh, five minutes, can you take? Five minutes, yes, definitely. I can definitely terminate this in five minutes. So, right, what happens? Um, so, I will show you, typically, in a, in a one-dimensional system, when you uh increase the interaction between the electrons so in the beginning electrons are placed in a line like that but you as as you increase interaction between the electron they try to because of strong coulomb repulsion they try to align themselves in this zigzag arrangement okay so this there are a few technical terms here which is one is proportion inversely proportional to the density of 1d electron and other is r naught which is proportional to confinement effective mass of electron and the, and these are primary important parameters so the electron one dimensional electron will become a zigzag of electron when the interaction between them is sufficiently large and uh, and they and when the confinement energy or potential energy is sufficiently low so this is a monte carlo calculation which shows that in the beginning, you have a 1D chain of electron. As you increase a interaction between the electrons, which you do by depleting electrons with the help of the torque gate, which I showed in the last two slides, then 1D chain of electrons kind of become two line of electron. And this is nothing but the observation of Wigner lattice. So in 1930s, Wigner, we all know who Wigner was. Wigner gave a theory that uh, electrons on, his, on the surface of any material can rearrange themselves into a periodic lattice if the density is sufficiently low. So this is what we have found experimentally that, uh, that a 1D chain of electron can become into a zigzag arrangement uh, and subsequently two independent lines when the density and confinement is manipulated. How experimentally that is seen, I will show you quickly. So when the electrons are strongly confined, then you have regular plateaus in the units of two square by h. But when we confine, when we weaker the confinement and also we reduce the carrier concentration, the first plateau disappears. You don't see any plateau appearing here. And then what happens? You have directly a plateau appearing at four square by h. So the mechanism is like that. One d you have in the beginning one d chain of electrons. And as you increase the interaction in between them and also weaken the confinement, they relax themselves comfortably because they are interacting. And when they relax, a stage appears that they from, from one chain, they, they form two chain of electrons. And each chain is contributing to two e square by h. So the first plateau disappears. This is a phenomenal uh, thing seen quantum mechanically in, in such systems where one row of electron can become two rows of electrons means we have established a lattice of electrons which is which is dependent on the self-organization of electrons um, around it so this is the uh, beautiful uh, uh, conductance of the entire system that you see you you in the in the beginning you have strongly confined system as you weaken the confinement particularly here your first plateau weakens and you start seeing disappearance of the or weakening of the pl first plateau and this region is where your electrons have become or crystallized into two rows 
and this two row situation is uh, this two row situation is something uh, containing a uh, very useful uh, quantum uh, physics particularly so this is one of the experiments we conducted where we were able to um, focus that two row which was formed as i showed in the last slide we focused in the sense we literally image those two rows of electron via a technique which is called ele um, transverse electron focusing so if you may uh, try to understand here so we have in this area where there is a top gate a a wigner crystal form two rows of electron and then we apply a small perpendicular field because of cyclotron motion electron will bend and collect across here so if we have a single row of electron then we will have a single peak in that focusing experiment but when we have two chain form then that peak splits into two so this was an experimental demonstration we did a couple of years ago of of producing a zigzag of electron last thing to show is this is all known plenty of room at the bottom it is a well known quote from richard fenneman that we know similarly in one dimensional system below the first plateau there is a rich physics present and which we have recently discovered by seeing a variety of fractional plateaus appearing below the first plateau so you may see that we have seen variety of new fractional states present when the interaction effect is sufficiently large and the electrons they come together they form quasi particles and these quasi particles are, are are found to possess fractional charges uh, fractional conductance or most likely fractional charges also so basically what we have found in the in this recent work that it is possible that in, uh, in using solid state system the one uh, we are using we may be able to create fractional states of electrons means they may have fractional charges if they have fractional charges that means they can be exploited for the upcoming quantum technologies which is based on qubits here it is not a qubit phenomena rather you are able to precisely manipulate the, the charge of electron to variety of fractional states like one third, one fifth, two third. So you may be able to use this system in near future for secure quantum computing applications. So I would say uh, this is probably slide number two. Yeah, I will conclude my presentation here with thanks to these funders who have supported uh, research that we do in the lab. Any questions, please let me know. Uh, any questions from participant side can ask now. Feel free to ask. Sanju, since there are no questions, maybe probably I will ask one. Go for Such it. a fantastic physics actually it means I'm always amazed by the kind of physics you do. Those who are present over here, those who are present over here, let me tell everyone that Sanjeev had an opportunity to work in a very famous laboratory in the world. And the lab name of the laboratory is Cavendish Laboratory in University of Cambridge. And let me tell you, for what it is famous. So this laboratory is not famous for at least, not only famous for one Nobel Prize, it has received multiple Nobel Prizes actually. Uh, physics for electronics is studied at very fundamental level. And uh, we are proud to have a presenter who is related to that particular laboratory. Thank you, one more, one, one theory from me. Hmm. How far do you think a development of quantum computing chips uh, from now means uh, what, what do you think what could be the time scale although it is very difficult to actually hypothesize or to to predict uh, to be honest with you <clears throat> there have been several progresses in the field so uh, there are several startup companies which have come 
to to develop quantum technologies and based on for example in oxford there is a company in cambridge a new company has been initiated so what they are doing they have installed cryostats in their lab it's like new startup a bunch of graduates they came together and they started new schemes so yes google launched last year a, a quantum computer based on cryogenic systems the one which i use you know that and and it is based on qubits quantum bits and uh, it was a 70 bit quantum computer so they are there but if you ask me practical realization of such systems i see it is still far like at least at least 10 years but but uk is definitely uh, one of the front runners in the field because of a the, there is a proper direction we know what we want and of course funding so uh, there is definitely uh, going to be lots of initiatives in this particular direction of quantum computing not only quantum computing topology also so topology is part of quantum computing so there is a there are variety of things which are clubbed together 2016 nobel prize was given to three physicists for the concept of topological materials so it's a, it's a very fundamental and un, a non trivial phenomena where topology affects the quantum physics significantly and since then a number of new investigations have been performed for example topological materials is one of the one of the one of the new fields which has taken a quantum leap people are trying to understand this conduction electron conducts only on the surface bulk it is insulating so just imagine how remarkable the system is your bulk doesn't conduct but your surface conducts so 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 i would say uh, uh, to be realistic for a quantum chip to be seen which would serve the purpose for a lab for demonstration we are not far within a couple of years it is possible yes okay. indeed looking forward to it yeah definitely it would be Perfect. so uh, if do you had anybody any question stupid question is more than welcome uh one two questions from participants said we can learn yeah anybody anybody else okay ha uh, yeah i uh, receive one question from nasir okay please sir do you think using smart chip for identifying protein biomarkers uh, tropi uh, troponin cardiac will be able to reduce cbd disease in the near future are you getting yeah, na- nasir nasir uh, thank you for this question actually so i was i was working on this problem of looking at troponin biomarkers so troponin is one of the biomarker for the heart attack troponin is a protein which is present in our blood when someone goes through the heart attack and yes actually uh, the best thing which can happen is there is a golden hour so if someone suffers from heart attack a first hour is called as golden hour and if you can if you can save patient's life or if you can act in that particular golden hour then damage to the patient is very minimal so i was working on a similar project at iit bombay in 2003 to detect not only troponin so there were two more biomarkers like myoglobin and ckmb so three biomarkers simultaneously troponin ckmb and myoglobin and now there are already chips in the market so yes uh, availability availability of these uh, chips in the market is certainly beneficial to reduce the mortality because of cardiovascular diseases thank you nasir again sorry probably this was slightly diversion from sanjeev's topic actually thank you sir <coughs> uh no more questions should be moving right? uh now i would like to invite dr kunal de gaikwad sir assistant professor department of electronics to express a uh, vote of thanks lalchan ji lalchan ji there is one one nice question from okay, jaspal okay. yeah jaspal um, sir 
हाँ ओके हाउ वी कैन कंपेयर फोटोनिक इंटीग्रेटेड सर्किट एंड क्वांटम चिप्स यू कैन डेफिनेटली बिकॉज क्वांटम फोटोनिक इज मोर एडवांस्ड इन टर्म्स ऑफ क्वांटम टेक्नोलॉजी देन द सॉलिड स्टेट सिस्टम्स सो अ लॉट ऑफ थिंग फॉर एग्जाम्पल इन 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 क्वांटम फोटोनिक बेस्ड सिस्टम्स they were the first where electron hole pairing in an and photonic entanglement was established so probably a, you know for, uh, for fiber optic communication so which is a prime thing so in photonics uh, photonics based chips are well established in such systems electrons entanglement is a which is a quantum mechanical phenomena has been seen established solid state systems the one i presented are still not well developed yet for the reason because it is so difficult to deal with electrons they are very naughty you know you have to control and handle them very uh, you know in a very nicer way they are very sensitive to the impurities whereas photons are not so i hope i'm able to answer your question so there is there is a lot of advancement in photonics based Uh, quantum devices then the solid state systems and uh, and for photonics you don't need very low temperature operation because like you can you they can show coherence quantum mechanical phenomena even at room temperature which you can use uh, to polarize your photonic based devices so so there is definitely a clear distinction and 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 i would say no comparison between the two one is well established the other is still developing Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, Jaspal, sir, uh, I think you got the answer. Please, uh, okay, Nasir, sir. Again, uh, there is one question from Nasir, sir. Please, sir, do you think using device in our skin in order to monitor our lifestyle will be able to reduce uh, some heart diseases? Yeah, Nasir. some wearable device some some form of wearable devices they will definitely help not actually work on skin so many there are many sensors which can be integrated on skin just like tattoos there are different issues around those which are like for uh, nanotoxicity uh, the issue of nanotoxicity is around uh, there which hasn't been solved but there are multiple wearable devices which are like smart watches and they will definitely be able to reduce the mortality related to cardiovascular diseases which are related to our lifestyle yeah if you have more questions we can take it offline means uh, if you keep you you can get you can just google my email address so it is samadhan.patil@ yeah let me write it down over here and anyone can ask me queries by that time if you have questions for sanjeev please post it over here otherwise i think uh, so this is my email address you can post me your queries any time okay uh probably everyone got the email id of uh, dr samadhan patil sir uh, you can uh, yeah, mail also, your query I, i can provide yeah. you email address of sanjeev as well sanjeev if you have more queries because i think sanjeev's subject is so complicated even i struggle to understand it let me be very <laughs> very honest uh, uh but i think uh, uh this is such a complicated science which is evolving around actually so if you contact me i will be happy to connect with with sanjeev but sanjeev feel free to write your email address if you you would like to welcome queries from others yeah yeah definitely no problem i mean if they want to contact simple to google you know my name and ucl your name and yeah. york <laughs> yeah may i post your uh, uh, email id sir Yes, if if you if somebody wants, absolutely no problem. Yeah. Okay, just one second. Jyoti Jyoti has a comment. 
May I do a pull down? Yes, certainly. You are most welcome. I am waiting for a few projects. Uh, you can be in my contact. Uh, as soon as there is a position available, I will be in your contact. Okay, so should we move ahead? Any other questions? Okay, so Dr. Kunal Gaikwad, sir, it's over to you. Please express the word of thanks. Uh, your mic is muted. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patle. It's an honor to have been asked to offer a vote of thanks on the occasion of the international webinar on futuristic devices from healthcare to quantum computing 2021. I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to our honorable president, Advocate Sanjit Suresh Patil, and all the management officials of our institute. They always inspire us and guide us to organize such an event. On the behalf of my Mahatma Gandhi Shikshan Mandal, Art, Science and Commerce College Kopra and Department of Electronics, I entire teaching fraternity and on my own behalf, extend a very hearty vote of thanks to all the speakers for gracing your important work and sharing with us your findings and opinions today. I extend my gratitude towards Professor B.V. Pawar, Pro VC, KBC NMU Jalgao, he explained in his inaugural speech the importance of quantum computing and how it is used to solve the problems in mathematics and coding modeling and gives his time from his busy mm -hmm. schedule. Uh, thank you very much, sir. We all are inspired by, our, by your great words. And a big thank you to Professor Shaligram, sir, for his efforts towards smart sensor in that he explained beautifully how to progress of technology in sensor from basic to advanced and how sensor is used in our daily life. Thank you so much, sir, for your technical talk. Mm -hmm. I also mention our deep sense of appreciation to Dr. Samadhan Patil, sir, for his explanation on microfabrication of lab on chip devices handled a diagnostic to organ on a chip. In his technical talk, he basically focused on biosensor and how he made the hybrid sensor using MEMS and magnetic sensor. And MEMS sensor that is used in HIV infection, hemophilia, etc. And he also focused on chip metabolism. So thank you very much, sir, for your for your sharing the knowledge with us. Now I may like to express our sincere thanks to Dr. Prashant Saxena for giving an excellent coverage to his topic, name how fundamental mechanics helps engineers, surgeons, and rocket scientists. He discussed in his talk that an application of applied mechanics on studies of biomechanics and soft robotics. I further, we are grateful to Dr. Sanju Kumar for demonstrating his topic beautifully on chip quantum laboratory. So thank you, thank you very much, sir. And finally, I also thanks to our in-charge principal and convener of this international webinar, Professor A.L. Choudhury, sir, for his kind support and guidance he has extended to all of us at this international webinar. I also thank to all the vice principals of our institute for continuous support. I also extend my thanks to Dr. L.B. Patle and Dr. M.P. Bode, coordinators for their enormous cooperation in the organization of this event. Uh, well, dear, it's uh, participants and all the teaching fraternity, an event like this cannot happen overnight. So the wheel starts rolling weeks ago. It requires a planning and a bird's eye for details. We have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very motivated and dedicated colleagues of Mahatma Gandhi Shikshan Mandal's Arts and Science College College Chopra, who know their jobs and are result oriented. So I cannot thank everyone enough for their involvement and their willingness to take on the completion of tasks beyond their comfort zones. So this evening are so full of hope and inspiration. So wishing you a very wonderful evening and I hope you are having a refreshing and knowledgeable evening. So thank you all and very happy, very happy evening to all. And I think Dr. L.B. Patle, sir, share the feedback link. So
so with the kind permission of the convener uh may I have permission uh dr l chaudhary sir can you speak something or can i close uh, just wait one note uh, notice for the participants uh i have shared the feedback form uh, feedback link on the chat box so you will get the certificate by tomorrow evening so be patient for that and thank you very much uh, sir chaudhary sir can you speak something small note chaudhary sir can you hear us chaudhary sir this network is okay okay so we do permission of the convener uh, thank you everyone and now our webinar has been closed here so thank you thank you very much sir thank you samadhan sir okay if anybody has any query regarding the certificates please feel free to call me or uh, message me i will cooperate with you so our webinar is over here thank you very much okay thank you all the participants